call the meeting to order at uh, about 6.10 or even. Um, some amendments that we need to make to, to the agenda tonight is um, we are going to move uh, the adoption right after consent agenda, and then we will go into time scheduled appointments. And then we have to add um, an executive session for personnel tonight. Um, I also want to remind everybody that um, we have, we've, we've got a really large board. I feel like we're not very intimate tonight. I know, it's very small. It's kind of odd. Hi, everybody. Um, we have a really large board, and some of the things that are coming forward are really, really tough subjects. And we really need to spend um, more time discussing some of these subject matters so that we make the right decisions for our kids for the long haul. Um, and a lot of these meetings are, we hear a lot of feedback from our audience. Um, and we really appreciate feedback from our audience. But tonight, um, after our community engagement and public comment session, I'm gonna ask that you allow us tonight to really dive deep into some of these conversations because we haven't had that opportunity and um, we, we really need to, as a full board, hear from everybody on the board. So people, please do not be shy tonight in expressing kind of how you're feeling or what your thoughts are with some of the things. <laughs> okay, Jim. And we're not going to hear from Jim six times during one subject matter. Um, but just so that we can really dive deep into some of these conversations we're having tonight. And please be respectful of each other. We don't all have to agree on the decisions that are being made, but I do ask that we be respectful of each other's thoughts. Okay, now we're moving on. Um, community engagement and public comment, comment session. Does anybody have anything to say before we head into things? And if you do, please stand up, announce who you are, where you're from, so that Raina can take your name and, and address this. Anyone? Yes, hi. I'm Anna Sessa. As most of y'all know, I live right here in beautiful Reading. Um, I just wanted to thank, there were a couple of board members I saw walking around and chatting with teachers about the changes that have been made um, in the past year, losing four, five, and six from this school. Um, and I just wanted to thank y'all for being here and specifically to those who um, were indeed out um, learning about the stuff that you guys control. So thank you to those. Hi. Uh, my name is Seth Westbrook. I'm a Palm Pit resident, uh, former school board member. I was at the presentation on Thursday, and I just want to say that there was widespread community concern about the solution as presented, and there needs, there seems to be a need for more detailed numbers and clarified scope of work about the project. So um, that's what I have to say. Thanks. Hi, I'm and I just wanted to say there was a comment made last Thursday about the Puffer community being responsible for the mold because we did supposedly nothing at the time. And if you just bear with me, I'll give you a quick history of what, of what happened then because I thought that comment was inaccurate and also not productive. And that's why I'm here tonight to speak to you. Um, years ago, when the Pompet School was being built, the school board contracted with a very well-respected construction company, Trumbo Nelson, and a respected local architect, Michael Weinberger, and hired a clerk of the works, which was an appropriate good thing to do. Unfortunately, that person left about halfway through the process, and um, that's too bad. I don't know if that has, has anything to do with what happened, but throw that out there for, for accurate information. So when they got to the gym and they tried to put the tiles down, they didn't stick. And so they started to look into why that would be. And in the process, as was stated last Thursday, they drilled some holes in the concrete and they found moisture 
Um, I'm not privy to all the discussions that went on at that time, but uh, they closed the holes back up, as was also stated last Thursday, but they did not do nothing. The reason the holes were filled back up and no construction remedy was made at that time was because there was no money. There was just nothing available for, for that kind of remedy. Um, Trumbull Nelson did give some money to the town to help mitigate the tile problem. And unfortunately, it's kind of strange, but the, the architect had let his insurance lap, so the town felt they had no recourse there, and, and that never went any place. So um, the, re the mitigation that was decided upon at that time, and I was, the, I was a parent in, of, the, of kids in the school at that time, the mitigation that was decided upon was going to be how the building was treated. And it was decided that the building would be cared for in a certain way through any non-winter month. And that worked, and it worked for 25 years. Um, it's 20, I, 25, 26, whenever this came up. And I don't know what happened when the consolidation came about. I blame nobody, these things do happen, but somehow that information was not conveyed beyond, you know, beyond um, whoever had it at that point. But it is not accurate to say that Pomfret did nothing and Pomfret is to blame, because that is what was said, basically. Pomfret is to blame for the mold problem now, because it, it's not true. And I just want to set that straight. Great, thank you very much. Yes. I am Bob Pomfret. Do I take from the agenda that once the agenda items start getting discussed by the board that no comments will be welcome from the public? Correct. Okay. Is it true that the last thing on the agenda is that the board's going to vote on the reconfiguration plan presented tonight that at 7 o'clock? We are not voting tonight. We are only discuss, discussing what we are thinking of doing so that we can have a better dive into the conversation with the entire board here tonight. On the, re on the reconfiguration? Yes. Okay, then in that case, I'd like to read a letter. Okay. At the last school board meeting, forgive me, it's That's probably okay. more efficient to do it this way than to meander. No worries. At the last um, school board meeting, Joe Rigoli, the director of building and grounds, presented the results of various engineering analyses and testing done on the Pomfret School interior humidity and mold problem over the last year and a half. There are a lot of recommended actions to be taken that would bring the school back to like new condition. They included a wide range of things, such as replacing the cabinets and bulletin boards, as well as continued monitoring the humidity levels, building a big humidification system, etc. The preliminary estimate for all the various actions is $550,000. But one recommendation stood out as the one that must be done now. If the school is going to be reopened in the fall, no matter what it's going to be used for, you need to repair the failed exterior foundation drains, drains waterproof the foundation, and regrade to move water away from the building. That would cost $85,000 and could be covered in this year's budget, utilizing monies already allocated to maintaining the school. While it may be fine to seek the advanced knowledge of geotechnical engineers regarding the problem, it's pretty amazing that after spending tens of thousands of dollars doing so, they are still perplexed as to where the water is coming from. What seems to be obvious to a more common sense minded Vermonter is that before you do anything else, before designing a dehumidification system for unknown future humidity levels, before installing the sub-slab depressurization systems, and certainly before replacing any flooring, cabinets, or bulletin boards, one might want to eliminate the 35,000 gallons of water coming off the roof per month, as well as another 15,000 gallons coming off the berm, pouring up against the waterproof foundation with no drainage. It must be remembered that although the school had moisture problems from the day it was built, 
It functioned well enough, providing a truly precious environment for our children for over 25 years, and will again for far less than a $550,000 price tag for the all-in remediation. Therefore, this school board should immediately get bids to repair the drains and waterproof the foundations and proceed to have it done before Thanksgiving. Continue monitoring the humidity levels throughout the winter. Have the school deep cleaned with HEPA vacs, as was done once before, and start budgeting immediately to open the school in the fall. To start talking about reconfiguration after not more than two hours of internal discussion, plus the conference meeting, to present this to the board before anybody in the public knows about it, with a school that can't even be opened for the purpose, any purpose, is irresponsible, in my opinion. Thanks. Thank Chair and Board Committee reports. Um, as I said tonight, we're talking about uh, a tough, su a tough subject matter tonight, which is the Prosper Valley facility and how we move forward with it. Um, I also will be discussing. Oh, I wanted to talk about. I received an email today from uh, Nicole Mace at the VSBA on the state of affairs with healthcare and and our negotiations with it at the state level. Um, as you know, the state level is negotiating new health care benefits um, with the school board, um, a selected group of school board members, as well as the school union for teachers. Um, they have gone into mediation and they have recently been asked to give their final suggestion as to what they would like to do because it is now going to an arbitrator. Once it goes to the arbitrator, the arbitrator will make a binding decision. It's, it, it is not a decision that they get to renegotiate as we've been in negotiations in the past. When we go to mediation, they can make a suggestion to us and both parties can come back together and renegotiate some of those suggestions if you so choose. Um, they have chosen, since they are at such odds, um, to go to a binding arbitrator. Um, once that arbitration comes into effect, we will, we will know the results in, I, I'm hoping December is kind of the time period to, to hear it so that we'll have an idea budgetary-wise how that's going to affect our budget. Um, and will also affect how we will negotiate our future contracts coming up. Um, but to keep in mind as well that the benefits will start taking place that will be um, decided on in January of 2021. So we will have to negotiate what those benefits will be from July 1st, 2020 through December of 2020. Um, I just wanted to update you on all that. We also received a note that healthcare um, will be increased by a minimum of 12.4% for the next upcoming budget season, which equates to $350,000 within our budget line for healthcare for our teachers. Increase. So, increase. So please just be aware of that. Um, I am flabbergasted that we have seen another major increase like that when two years ago we saw a 12% increase, last year we saw an 8% increase, and this year we're going to see about a 12.5% increase. That's over 35% in the last three years. That is absurd to me that the healthcare industry thinks that's acceptable for us. And it, as, a, as a gauge over the last however many years we've been in the four, you know, yeah. Three, four, five percent. So these are huge increases that we have absolutely no control over. Especially for those of you who are new to the board and, and, and came on in March, you know we're gonna we're, we're starting to work on our budget now. We'll really start in November and December. We'll finalize with numbers in January. You know 
we, we've used in, um, in years past when we didn't know the actual rate, we've used four as a place mark, which just goes to show you 12.2 and 12.4 is just it's huge. I mean, it's a $350,000 increase over what we have now. It's huge. Um, other things to report is next meeting, Jennifer and I um, are going to uh, revise our subcommittees and not all, because we are such a large, large board, it is very difficult to assign every single one of you to a subcommittee. So we are going to assign you as appropriately as we can. If you have interest in a subcommittee, please join it. Um, we have no problems with that. Um, we are also going to clarify what the ad hoc team, um, which we will explain next meeting as well, who will be overseeing the process of the development of a possible new build for a middle school, high school, um, and, and moving that project forward, as well as really reiterating what are the responsibilities from board members to superintendent to staff members and to ad hoc committee um, members as well who are forming this committee. It's really important that we understand what our roles are as we move forward um, so that we can advocate properly um, for this either renovation or new build of, of the middle school, um, high school project. Um, so it will be actually an ad hoc committee that is based on a project only. Um, and that's all I have to report tonight. I will also update you in executive session on our progress with Mary Best review process. Um, and that's it. Um, Finance committee is meeting tomorrow at three o'clock. If any of you are interested in starting that like conversation, to get a what those meetings are like, yes, More than um, you are welcome to. Uh, Bob, do you have anything that you'd like to update? Um, us on configuration. Yeah, tonight. Sure. Just a right. replay, or uh, I don't even want to do a replay. Okay, but just an update <laughs> of where we're at, or yeah, would you yeah. like to speak later? Uh, whatever makes sense. Okay. The, the first point I'd like to make is I would love to get clarity in Robert's rules. Standing committees of the board are committees, <laughs> to my background and knowledge. So they're not subcommittees. There's the board, then right. there are committees, and then there are subcommittees. So if, if I'm cockeyed, then I'd be happy to be, you know, educated. But just so there's clarity about the committees you're talking about, forming and talking about are full committees of the board, and then there's subcommittees of those committees, and there may be then ad hoc committees, Correct. working groups. And we are going to clarify okay. all of that. Cool. Right. Um, I'd be happy to give uh, an update, uh, and as Bryce chime in, we were at the Pomfret Town offices last Thursday, an opportunity for the Configuration and Enrollment Growth Committee to bring uh, Mary Beth's presentation and recommendation into the community of Pomfret. Uh, we had good attendance, we had a good conversation. Uh, there's uh, it's obviously an emotional topic based on Mary Beth's recommendation. Um, we got lots of good feedback, we heard some of that from Bob Green tonight. Um, and I think it, it's uh, helpful to the committee to have a conversation with the full board and hear Mary Beth's uh, presentation and recommendation so that the configuration committee can take that uh, informed discussion and go back and come up with uh, the you know, answer the charge that we were asked to make, which was to come forward with uh, a recommendation based on what we know about circumstances with the Pomfret School building and um, TPBX. So uh, Joe Rigoli uh, was there extremely helpful in laying out the community exactly where we are with the building remediation. I just want to make clear that uh, because of some of the tenor and tone that we fully anticipated wanting to understand how the remediation effort that was undertaken at, at some expense um, to put in these venting pipes would um, perform over the hottest, most humid humid months of the year. So that really was June and July. So the committee did not meet in the summer 
but we had uh, every intention of being able to look at statistics and data that was being generated by Joe over the summer to understand whether um, and sort of you know where we were with humidity levels in the building. So it was it was it was uh, inferred that the committee did not meet on purpose. That was not the case. So I don't, Bryce. I don't know if you want to. No, I think that once you get to a topic, it's just, you know, I think that everybody here should want to hear Mary Beth's presentation, and then afterwards, I mean, I could bring up some points that um, some of the community members at the um, conference brought up. You know, but I think that'd be, be better for actually doing the presentation. Fine. So. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we already have the report. And actually, this is a, a slightly new structure from last year, as we have our first board meeting of the year at, at Woodstock in the middle school and high school, and then we're traveling out to elementary schools. So at those elementary school meetings, uh, John, can I tell you, um, what we'll be doing is having an elementary principal's report, and the elementary principal will speak Move to some, some um, key highlights from the building we're visiting, but also some of the collective work that the elementary principals are engaged in. You do have his report in this book, and now you have him in person. Hi, everybody. Hi, Welcome to uh, Reading Elementary School. I hope I saw some of you wandering around in our open house. Thanks for visiting the classrooms. I hope you got a chance to see the, um, the new STEAM lab and some of the equipment <coughs> in here that the kids are already using. Um, thank you for supporting that. Um, I know you can read my report. I do just want to highlight a couple of things in it and then just see if you have questions. Because um, I know we don't all manage to read everything that's in the, uh, the board packet. So um, I think from the Reading point of view, uh, Reading Elementary School, you know, I commented about the fact during the summer we did a lot of summer maintenance, just like happened at all of the schools. Um, but um, just to highlight, um, there was a lot of work done on the front of the building on window sills and, and molding. Um, uh, we did repairs in the back. Um, we did improvements to the playground. So again, I think it's a good message to send the community that you know we're still investing in all of our schools. Um, the um, uh, other thing I wanted to bring up is um, specifically um, elementary principals have been working very closely with our new coaches, our two new elementary uh, coaches. And uh, we actually are meeting, um, we have a regularly scheduled meeting once a week that we've been working together and then sort of some ad hoc meetings. Um, they are going to begin their first, what we would call a coaching cycle, um, next week. Um, both coaches, uh, they'll be working with a total of um, eight teachers. Um, and I know. As, as we all know, that one of our focus or foci this year is on math. And we happen to know that um, through self-selection, these teachers have um, opted to work. Uh, seven out of eight of them are working uh, in the area of math in their coaching cycle with these coaches. So um, it's really, I think, it grades really from first. Yeah, we have teachers in first through sixth grade that are participating in this first cycle. So they'll do. Sure. Explain to us what that cycle looks like. What does it look like when the teacher's coach, when the coach is coaching the teacher? Like, are they in the classroom all day long with the teacher? What does that look good, like? Good question. No, they're not. They're, they're definitely not in the classroom all day long. Um, they are. Um, there's actually. A, I wish I had brought it with me or projected for you. There's. There's sort of a, a, a format that they follow um, where. The teacher and the coach first get together and just sort of have a chat about, uh, from the teacher's perspective, you know, what they might want to work on, uh, what they're maybe having trouble with, or um, what they're, specifically, we're trying to get the teachers to focus on the idea of what are your students having trouble learning, um, and really try to keep this focus on student learning. Um, the coaches then help the teachers dig deeper into the data that we have. Um, and together they sort of formulate a plan to work for a six week period on a very particular and specific standard. Um, so for instance in math they would choose some particular standard that the data shows that the kids in the class are not achieving at the level that we want them to. They'll come up with a plan, they'll implement the plan, and the coach will then be in the classroom while that teacher is teaching that those classes, give feedback. Um, and then their um, benchmark assessments during the six-week period. Presumably there's some improvement along the way, and then at the end they can 
at the end of the six weeks, they can look to see how much improvement was there, did, did what we were doing work. If it didn't work, we got to come up with a new plan. If it did work, we can continue with that one. We can implement a new one for some other standard. Um, and we're hoping that both with that help that the teachers will get examining the data, um, that they can do even more of this on their own without the help of the coach um, once they sort of get this idea and, and chunk it into much smaller pieces than we've done in the past. Is that yeah, sort of, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of work with that. Then um, I wanted to actually give a shout out to the tech department. Um, and I wrote in here about a bunch of new software programs that the district um, has launched this, mostly this year, maybe a couple of them were around last year for a little bit. Um, and it's a lot. And, and any of you that know tech, to, to bring in this many different programs uh, over the summer with a tech department of, I think it's three, um, is a pretty big deal. In fact, I forgot to mention one of them, which was uh, the S'more newsletters, um, which we're also doing. So there's really five new, new things. Um, and so really, um, Raph and Ron and Sarah are doing a great job. And, and uh, I just want to tell you that, that I think all the principals are really happy and impressed. Um, for instance, the Alma Student Information System replaces our previous one, I won't mention by name since there's a video camera going, but the, let's just say that the new one is a lot better. Uh, much, much better. Um, and uh, the TeachPoint software is really exciting for us because this is, it's uh, for pro professional, teacher professional <coughs> development and um, our evaluation system. So it's, it's really, um, it's a very helpful way for the principals to be interacting with teachers to help guide them uh, both in their professional development but also to uh, you know, do our evaluations and, and keep everything on the up and up in terms of all those you know, things that we have to do contractually. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, I did want to mention um, the sixth grade. You may have heard some things about um, the uh, annual trip that the sixth grade has taken in this district, um, or I say the sixth grade, it's actually not been the entire sixth grade. It's been all of the sixth grades except the Woodstock sixth grade have gone to Nature's Classroom in Maine. Um, the sixth grade in Woodstock uh, changed a few years ago to go to a Nature's Classroom program for a shorter amount of time in New Hampshire. Um, we, the principals have looked pretty closely at this uh, during the summer. And based on just what we budgeted this year and, and a host of other considerations, um, but, but just to give you an idea, the cost for this trip keeps getting higher. Um, and we're really looking at a cost of almost $500 per student when, you, when you're all in with cost for busing, uh, EMT that goes with us, um, and just the, the tuition for the program. Um, and we were having difficulty both finding that money and, and really supporting that amount of money. And we did get a lot of feedback, you know, feedback from people that, you know, parents that were willing to raise money, fundraising, um, and I'm, I guess it's not necessarily out of the question, but, you know, I think we as principals spoke with our staff. I get really nervous about having to spend that kind of effort on fundraising um, during school year. Um, it, it, it absolutely takes away from the time the teachers have um, to be working on what I consider to be a lot more important stuff than you know, running a fundraiser. Um, so I'm sure we're, we're going to get some, some heat on this one. Um, you need to know next week, the sixth grade, the entire district sixth grade will be uh, participating at Marsh Billings um, uh, historic site with the um, geez, Way of, web of Life, thank you. Um, and um, we are working, the, the whole sixth grade team is working on putting something else together for the end of the year. Um, I don't think it's going to be, it's certainly not going to be a four night, five day trip, but there is definitely going to be some activity for the entire district sixth grade. Um, Can I just ask one question? There also is an HOC program or I think it was the fourth, fourth grader. Grader. Is, is that still existing or have you decided to pull that too? That is still happening this year. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure if, if 
Mayor Dunwoody, you know, I'm not sure if that's all. I, is that just Woodstock fourth graders, or is that? It used to be just Woodstock. I don't yeah. know how the district has I know Prosper didn't do that last year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we could just follow up with it at another meeting, just curious. Okay. And then um, I made a note about immunizations because I know it's been in the news and um, every year the state gives us our immunization reports, our reported writings in here, but every school got a report. Um, and I think as a district, we're somewhere, in, we're close to the 95% um, immunization rate. Um, and in the vein of that, in terms of good health, um, I'm gonna close with the great news that Jamie Sudall today received notification that uh, she had passed her national nursing, let's say national board certified nursing exam in July. And she got that word today. And so she is now a national board certified nurse. That's really nice. Which is a really amazing accomplishment because there's quite, quite a lot of hoops to jump through to get that certification. There are not many nurses in the state that have it. So we're very fortunate. So, if there are any questions about anything I've said or anything in the report or anything that's not in the report, um, the ready for representative should probably know this we can ask you anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's the capacity of this at our school in Reading, and then what's our current enrollment from pre K? <laughs> well, our current enrollment pre K through grade three is 35, and that's 26. Um, I'm sorry, 30, yeah, 33. They're 26. <laughs> 26 um, K, K3 students, and then um, 11, pre-K, nine. Oh, that's right, do my math, 35 most of the So nine pre-Ks. Um, the capacity of this building, it's funny, I've never thought about that. The most I've ever seen here is 81. 81, okay. What is the capacity typically for a pre-K program? We are licensed. I'm trying not to piss off my child's teacher. Right? <laughs> our our license for pre-K is twenty students. Yeah. Yeah. So historically, with an each classroom, it's been a good experience. So are we down to just like a financial decision on that? Really, has the experience changed over the years that the schools that have been going? Um. um In the two years that I've seen it, I, I can't judge that. I think, I think it's a worthwhile experience. Um, you get down to the question, is it so worthwhile that it's worth that kind of money and that kind of time out of the classroom? There's some other considerations with it. Um, anecdotally, talking to the staff, it seems like over the years, there have been more difficulties um, with some students even wanting to come, um, mm -hmm. sort, of, sort of emotional type issues where, where kids just are so afraid of being away from home for that many days, and, and that has increased the, the number of kids that just aren't going on that trip. Um, and um, I think that's a consideration as well, just trying to figure out how to make sure we're still inclusive with, with all of the needs of the kids. And can we do something similar? I mean, I'm the first to admit, you know, one of the things that we try to teach in our science curriculum is the, are the different um, water ecosystems, and we can't get the ocean any place except at the ocean or in textbooks online, that sort of thing. So there's certainly a value in going there. Um, I sort of question how many of us go there anyway, um, maybe not under an educational um, way. But Again, it's, that, it's trying to make that balance that we all make as, as board and, and principals with the budget dollars that we have. Um, and it's just, I mean, it kills me to say this because I, you know, my career, I've been the guy that takes kids everywhere. I, I I'm travel, I try to take them on as many field trips as I possibly can. Um, but, you know, this one, that cost benefit was tough for me to justify. Kind of just historically, um, Elena, myself, and Jess went through that really hard debate of whether or not we could afford to continue it at Woodstock. And there were a lot of uh, a lot of things that went into the decision 
one, the expense at that time was $600 per student. So we were spending between, depending on the size of the sixth grade, between roughly $26,000 to $36,000 for one week for just the sixth grade. Um, the second thing that really came into consideration was we didn't have parent chaperones. So for that extended period of time for teachers, there, there was a stressor for those teachers to handle kids who didn't want to go on the trip, who um, maybe needed some extra help as well on the trip. Um, and then we started um, kind of, our, our thought process was, what is the purpose of the, of the trip? Was it educational or was it a social thing to get all these children from the entire district? And it started getting muddy in, from our teacher's perspective, it was getting muddied in why are we going and why do we go for this long? Because we're not sure what the real drive is anymore on the trip. If it's for combining all the kids from all the schools so that they experience each other, or is it really an educational trip first and foremost? So it, it was a very hard decision. I mean, I, we were not well-liked board members with the decision that came down. And, and it was tough because it was a tradition that was held for such a long period of time in our district. But just to let you know, it wasn't just purely financial. It was bigger than that. I think, I think my son was part of the first group who didn't go to the main major's classroom, but where they go now is also a major's classroom. It's just in New Hampshire, and it's for two nights instead of yeah. four. And I now have two kids who have gone through that, that shorter experience in New Hampshire, and it's been a great experience. So I, I think the kids are okay. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion on the table to approve the minutes from September 9th? So moved. Thank you, Pam. A second? A second. Well, thank you, Claire. Um, all this in favor of the motion hey, on the table? Hang on. Can we keep the discussion just Just a correction? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Yep, so pay is item seven, bullet one, line two, uh, the word council, C O U N C I L, should be C O U N S E L. Wouldn't be caught by the spell check, but that's a significant difference. The board didn't make that, knew that review when attorney did. Yes, you have that right in order, No. Okay. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Anything else then? No, that's it. Okay. Any others? Who's my first? Pam? Yes. We need to amend that. Oh, uh, what do I say? says <laughs> <laughs> amend. I'm amending the motion to, uh, to include what Ben just said. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. Right. All those opposed? The motion is passed. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to now go to the policy adopt, uh, adoption um, for the district grade reconfiguration policy. Uh, Pam and where is Hey, Jim. Would you like to review this for us since we had some confusion in our last meeting? I'll let you go for it. Okay, <laughs> so um, just I guess a, a question about the procedure for the, the last part of the bargaining update includes a conversation about this, but we should put that aside for now, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, basically, I think because it was summer and um, things got a little bit confused over the time period when we weren't seeing each other as often or whatever it is that happens, we kind of had um, a couple typos in this policy before. So we went back to room, we fixed it to where it was, um, where it was supposed to be two weeks ago. So um, that's what it is now. And that's basically it, correct? Correct. Right. We were 
sent out at the last meeting to put it back to where it was, um, where it was supposed to be for that meeting for a vote. Correct. And then where it goes from there is, is there other discussion of what? So do I have a motion on the table to approve the policy in front of you tonight? So I'll make the motion. Okay. Do I have a second? A second. Thank okay. you. Blue. And, and this is the time if do you have any wants. questions or I have a, a comment that I don't uh, I don't believe that this policy addresses um, some of the protections that are necessary to make sure that restructuring doesn't happen in an arbitrary fashion. It just needs a little bit more and I frankly think that when we got to this, the last piece of all of the viability policies, we retired and it was the end of our year and this got rushed through in my estimation, um, which could be just my opinion. But um, uh, I feel it needs a little bit more work and um, I'll just leave it at that. So I'm going to vote no on it. And if anybody agrees with me, please do too. So, so we met the other day. Richard was there. Sherry was there, Mary Beth was there, myself, and Pamela. And Pamela would like to, or Barnard would like to, insert another sentence. And the sentence, can you read that sentence off? Well, I think we should try to separate the comments. I know, but I'm just asking if you can read off the sentence so we can get to where the discussion was. So okay. the discussion was that you wanted to add this one specific sentence, and I think that's Everybody should hear what that sentence is. Well, we've changed the sentence after right. hearing your criticism. Right, I know, but can you read the sentence? sentence? Yeah, just read the sentence. Sure. Uh, any vote, this would be added to the second to last paragraph. Any vote to restructure an elementary school for the purpose of supporting new educational initiatives would require a majority board vote, if, which includes at least 50% of the board members representing the affected town. That's what you wanted to add in? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I, can I give a little clarification, Jim, if that's okay? Right. Um, it was my request, actually, um, to have the conversation at the, at the policy meeting as it related to the initial sentence, which was being requested from the bargain side of the negotiation. It wasn't to change the policy. It was never a request to change policy. It was to have a discussion as to whether or not the inclusion of the sentence at the time the policy committee thought materially changed the intent of the policy. And there was a robust conversation that went on that day. We did only have Pamela and Jim there. Lou was not able as a third member of the policy committee to uh, join us on such short notice. So it wasn't a matter of trying to change. It was a matter of just trying from my perspective as the one who was asked to sort of handle the negotiation from the school board side of working with Barn to get some clarification. And since that time, this one sentence has now changed. And I thought we were going to be discussing this later in the agenda. So um, we, can, we can go through it at that time. It might be more, more appropriate when we give an update on the articles of agreement. Well, well I, 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 I've asked a panel to bring up that one sentence, which was not what was just was said, that started this conversation the other day at the meeting. And that one sentence that you sent out to us, which it was. Let me find it, Jim. Sorry. It was. But can I look? Is this when you say that um, you think that it um, needs more work and maybe wasn't fully thought out or, or was rushed? Is Jim accurate? Is that is that the type of language you would like yes, to see added is, to it? Yes, that me forget about already exists. Yeah, but that, that was the type. Of, can you in. just repeat it one more time? Sure. Um, it, well, the, the background is that if you recall, the policy has, there's two reasons for restructuring. One falls under sustainability guidelines and thresholds, and the other one is for new educational initiatives. So the issue is that's a bit vague. So lots of things are new educational initiatives. So then following the new educational initiatives is the sentence, any vote to restructure an elementary school for the purpose of supporting new educational initiatives will require a majority board vote, which includes at least 50% of the board members representing the affected town. So what does that mean? So if it was killing the percent, there was a- well, let, let me ask a question yeah. to clarify, right? Because I will say this, and I think you know this, the policy committee has worked very, very hard to try to create a set of policies that are fair to everyone. 
That's what this is. This is not this is what I want to separate the cards. Well, we're going to decide if that's true or not. I'm going to ask a question about how it works. When you say 50% of the votes, does that mean 50% of the people in that town have to vote in the affirmative? No, there's a board vote. 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 There's a so I, I just, since this was a discussion between two us, what was said to me prior to the meeting was the sentence at the time was supposed to be added was no restructuring of grades in a school shall be made for the sole purpose of funding increased curricular offerings at other schools. That was a sentence was. that was sent out to me on this day. And I went to this meeting that was called and I had said on that sentence, I did not agree with it because, and I gave an example, if Killington Elementary School, sixth grade, okay, I, I truly believe having three daughters that went through Killington Elementary School, okay, that by the time it comes to January of their sixth grade, they are ready, or at least my three students, are ready to move on. Okay, so I had said, if for the sole purpose of maybe putting funding into Woodstock Elementary School for their STEM or STEAM lab, I'm not sure which one they have at this time, or to the high school, then I as a voter in the town of Killington would agree to that by putting more money into the sole purpose of that school to move our kids over. Pamela agreed with that and then said, well, maybe that's not the sentence to add, and I think that's now where this other sentence or paragraph is coming in. And that's when I had said, our goal was to come back to this meeting to change what we expected it to be at the prior meeting. Then we get into, Barnard is now, or, or, or one representative Barnard, I don't know about the other one, to say that they will vote no on this specific policy. And that's where we are. So that's why I don't think, like, you know, but if, if we vote yes, or if we, if we vote yes for the way I believe that the policy should be, and Barnard votes no, then to have a discussion later on underneath the Barnard would be useless to me, I'm sorry. But if we vote yes, that it should be sent back for further discussion to change something, then we should be voting no at this point. Pam, I mean, you have a left hand up. To your oh, I'm sorry, Claire. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking back to our board training with that um, nice woman from the Vermont School Board Association back in March at our first board meeting, and I think one of the things that she really drilled home to us was that we need to be coming to this table as board members of a unified district and not as board members from the town where we live. Um, and so I think any policy that creates situations where a certain number of board members from a certain town are responsible for voting in or out, just making a little bit on quick like, yes of course make me a little bit uncomfortable I'm just not sure if that's the precedent we should be setting as a unified district who we should each be voting each time for what's best for the most students within the district is my understanding of, of what our what our goals are each time we come together. I'm to respond to that because I think you misunderstand what I'm saying. When I say I, I think anytime a board member votes no that they have the responsibility to tell the board that they're going to, that so it can go into the minutes. Um, that's why I'm saying that I'm voting no, and I then I mean in the sentence, the policy sentence. That's what I mean. The, the one you wanted to add about okay. fifty percent of board members from that particular town have to vote yes for it to be. A, that concerns. That's that's a precedent okay. that feels okay. uncomfortable okay. to me in terms of what our goals are as a unified district. Okay. I mean, to respond to that, I guess the, the, the challenge yeah, the, the challenge that, um, that I feel has not been addressed is that in some cases we have seen it, um, and going forward for future boards, um, I'd like to see, I think it would be important for, for fairness's sake, 
to make sure that there is like parity and equity and that there's not a kind of asymmetrical thing that happens where one school is singled out for restructuring in a way that doesn't have super strong justification. Um, that's, uh, this is really not about, this is, this is about the whole district and creating a healthy district. It's not, um, it's not about one town. It's about making right, sure that all the students are treated sentence. the same. Right, but then why the, 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 the thing is about the sentence, the sentence is, is suggestion, yeah, 50, a starting point. For representatives from one town, but that's the part that feels uncomfortable to me. So that just means that, that, that there would be support for it. That, that shows a level of support. That, I mean, but the specifics of the sentence, I think the conversation right now should maybe be, are we even gonna have the conversation? And then talk about the specifics, right? Well, there's a good question. Um, oh, wait, I'm Bro. sorry. Lou, did you have your hand up first? I did not. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. I, I was, right? so I guess, um, being the other writer representative also, <laughs> but I, I I don't know as I agree with the suggested sentence, to be honest, but um, I, I do share the concern about how vague the last sentence is, not the first paragraph. Um, you know, we have the first part, it's referring to, uh, you know, saying that this will be based on the criteria from this other policy that we've all adopted that was thoroughly thought out. And then the second piece is just saying, or be based on educational aims or initiatives, which I think that that point to me is what sticks as being very open-ended. And the fact that the first part we have a whole other policy to address, but the second part is just that sentence um, feels very loose. Um, in particular, the word equitably could solve that, but I don't think it does because it's used so commonly in ways that it's maybe not even always intended to be. So fleshing out what equitably means. So in Jim's example, I don't necessarily disagree. If we moved all the sixth grade classes to one location that saves money to, to invest in a school, that makes a lot of sense. But if you just said, well, we're going to eliminate four grades from only this one school to you know, do something with the high school, and there was no other discussion, no other policy around that, I just feel like that seems a little too loose to me. Okay. Um, Lou has his hand up. Yeah, so I, I would go like, to, to the sentence Pam proposes. I would not support that. I mean, having been on that committee and gone through this all summer and, and worked through what we think is trying to get to like a very firm middle ground for all involved. Um, we could type up the sentence you're talking about, right? I mean, although at some point we can't create policy that's going to basically address every single situation. At times we have to trust the board process to be fair. And if all we're going to do is take the board's authority and what we're going to do and invest it in one or two people, I don't think that's the way this board should go. What we can do is continue to work on policies that are fair to every single school and every single resident. And that's exactly what we've been doing all summer. We have a lot of meetings. So how do you feel this about this, this policy? This wasn't a couple meetings. This was, you know, a whole series of meetings way beyond what was already going on on the board. So I don't think we were tired when we created it. I don't think any of that is, is accurate. I do think that what is here is probably close to being right, but I would not support what Pam recommends. So, okay. Hold on, Elena had her hand up. And then I'm going to do two of them there. I think I, I'll just finish the thoughts by saying that I think the, that last sentence was left a little bit vague on purpose, if I remember that conversation correctly, because we also didn't want to be so restrictive that if changes were happening at one school, then that would mean that changes would have to happen at every school. Because the way I remember that sentence being structure, if we had left it that way, then that's exactly what that would have meant. And so then I feel like that would have just, that would have not been okay, especially with programming decisions, or if you had to maybe combine a grade at one school for certain purposes, then we would have had to look at all the schools and do we need to do that at every school? Okay. So I think we have to be careful with that. Bob? Um, um, I mean, it seems to me that it ends up being a one board member veto. Uh, of any potential change that's recommended, and that just doesn't make sense. Um, what I will say as well is that we are far into a conversation about re reallocating money resources out of TPVS and in another direction. And as much as you know, that's I think got to continue to be the purview of this combined board. As hard as that is, it has to remain the purview of this board to make those reallocation decisions. They're not pleasant. They're not pleasant right now. 
So I, I think it would simply give me the ability to say, no, 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 and we can't. It doesn't work. So to be fair with the page, I mean, with about Pamela here is that what we're having this discussion here is, and, and Brian, you're saying that maybe it's a little weak. Monina, well, you're saying you remember, I, I remember exactly what you're saying. It was a little stricter there, and then we kind of came back on it or whatever. All I'm saying here is I wanted to give a chance to everybody that's sitting on this board as it's up for a vote, instead of waiting for us to vote, whatever, 12 to 6 or whatever it is, or that we, we do have the option here, if this full board wants to, to send this policy back, that there's a full policy group together to have this discussion. I only said at that meeting that one sentence that I just read off was not really to be fit into here. Pamela, you agreed. Then we started getting into, well, let's start changing the, the sentence or a paragraph. And then I only said at that point, we were not given direction from the full board to start playing around with a whole bunch of words. That's all I said. And I said we should come here tonight and put this up for a vote and get information from each board member from every town here if you want to send this back to policy for a change. That's all I said at that meeting. Hold on, Adam had his hand up. Um, I think a couple of points. At first, I think it's coincidence or not that we're having this conversation in this building today when we met at this time last year, October last year, we decided to reconfigure three buildings to lead in this building, right? And you know, you made some good points, Lou, in terms of developing a policy that's always going to hit at every angle is pretty much impossible to do, right? It's a moving target. Um, and that we have to learn how to trust the board process and the policy. And I think trust is something that's going to take a long time with this uh, unified district and this board um, for us to trust each other. I think we're making a lot of progress, but for the community to trust us too. And I, I don't know how I want to vote about what you're saying, but I hear where you're coming from as the sole person who voted against reconfiguring a year ago, right? Um, but when we've been talking about these policies over the last, over the summer, as they've come to board meetings and policy committees reported, we've talked about um, the purpose of a policy is really to start and kind of guide conversation. It's not to be a definitive, this is a guy that has to be this policy, this procedure, these, these numbers. So I think it's important for us to keep that in mind in the same way that whatever you know uh, adjustments we're making to it, that it's to have this conversation going. Um, but you know, trusting the process is going to take a while, um, and uh, we're, we're we're just we're just kind of breaking the ice right now. Patty, um, I think I would question the trust thing as well as I look at what's going to be talked about at the Prosper Valley School, um, you know, at this meeting and what we're planning on doing as a reconfiguration that seems to somehow skirt our current policy um, and where this is going. I, I, anything that Pam says, I always have to think about a lot. So um, I'm not sure that that sentence fits exactly right, but I, I understand entirely where she's coming from. And I would also say that I fully appreciate that this is a unified board. It's the basis on which most of my votes have been placed with this board up to this point. Um, but I was also elected by the town of Concord, you know, and so I represent the voters there. And there are going to be things that come up that are going to seem Pomfret related that I'm going to vote potentially along those lines because I, I have a different view of what the benefit to the district is going to be. So it's not that clear cut that we're a unified board and that that's how that all plays out. And I would, you know, I, I agree. It should be so clear. Our policy should come forward. Our votes should come forward. Our questions should come forward. So glaringly beneficial, be beneficial to all of our students that the every vote is unanimous. That's, that's what we should be shooting for. But I'm going to, you know, the, the, the other elephant in the room is there's six of you from Woodstock. You know, Pam's point, I think, in no way is directed at the numbers here, but there becomes issues that that getting outvoted is a, an obvious thing that's going to happen for some of us in these, in these other towns. And it's on the minds of the voters, it's on the minds of the public, um, I, and it's on the back burner mind of my own. But, you know, I, and, you know, this will come up more in the, in the later discussion, but. 
trust is a huge part of all of this. And so, you know, let's, let's keep that in mind. Um, yeah, uh, I have so many thoughts, sorry. Um, I, I, I just, I guess what I would love to see, keeping in mind there have been other issues, such as grading, that we talked about for months and months and months. And years. Years, really. Um, not that I want to talk about this for months or years, but uh, it's, not, it's not completely unprecedented that we would decide to continue talking about something. And I'm definitely not, uh, as I said, married to that sentence. It's just that we've actually had two other sentences that uh, we've talked about, but criticisms made sense. And so, you know, I think I, I would just love to see this go back to the policy committee and have a further conversation and try to find a compromise between the flexibility and, and uh, the need for a little bit of tightening up. So, so basically, I, I didn't want to, I mean, we, we're sitting here and saying trust, and, and, and let's be honest, 80% of the people on this board, probably 80% of the people outside of town killing don't trust me. So, we're, but I'm okay, I'm okay with that, all right? But I'm sitting here today as one board member of, there's only like 16 of us here saying that I agree with Pamela that it should, this motion should be withdrawn and sent back to the full board to have it vented out, and maybe it comes back the same way, but at least to have it vented out once again. You and mean, I you trust it to the policy, to the policy, policy right, to the, yeah. well, this full board to right now, but to vent it out and then bring it back again. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm trying to work as all one, and I didn't want to have Barney sit here and go through and have us have a vote to say yes, and then have a discussion later on about another topic on here. I don't think that is right. I think whoever made the motion, because I haven't made a motion tonight, I think whoever made the motion should withdraw the motion, and I think whoever seconded should accept the withdrawal and send it back for this point. And we can go back to policy because and have a discussion about it and have Lou come in too on it. It may not come out the way you want it, but at least that's what you're looking for is some type of chance to, to speak. That's all. Uh, Lou, Lou, do you feel that way? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all for the process, right? And, and what I feel about the specific issue I think is irrelevant. But I do think if that's, if that's the process that Pam wants to follow, I've been on this committee with Pam for a long time and highly respect her work, I'm happy to follow that process. So who made the original motion? Jim. I did. <laughs> 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 I'll make a motion to move, uh, remove, um, withdraw the motion. Move, you second it. I'll accept the motion. All right. Always in favor of the motion. Always in favor of the motion. I think I just said yeah because you were looking for something. Say aye. 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 So now I'll make a motion for us to move this policy back forward to the policy committee to report back to us. Do I have a second? Okay. Do I have a second? Thank you. All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion is approved. Thank you. Sorry about that. Well, there's one other policy thing that we wanted to discuss. It's not on the agenda, but it's a real quick request. Um, we are just doing agenda setting. Um, sorry, we, we didn't convey this to you. Uh, we're doing agenda setting. We, we met last week and did it, and we're going to continue that. Just, uh, if anybody has any policies that they think that we should be um, discussing, putting into place, please write us an email. Write it to Raina. Write it to Raina. And we have our next year's worth of uh, policy meetings scheduled out. I believe it's the third Monday every month at 8 o'clock unless that third Monday falls on a holiday, and it's the second that we will be gone to. So in January and February, we're gone to the second. So we're trying to stay at least bring you once a month, bring you at least three policies. Thank you. Um, okay. So why don't we do the Barnard update then? Well, the Barnard update sort of goes along with the policy here uh, discussion. I do have some copies of 
Uh, let's go back a little bit. I was requested to work with our council and with Barnard in potentially providing updated articles of organization that would be um, hopefully endorsed by this board and supported by Barnard as a basis for them moving forward. The original thought was at the end of October in voting whether or not to join the um, modified unified school district. Uh, which then would trigger on um, voting day in March, all of the districts voting, assuming that it was a positive vote by Barnard, in March to vote to accept Barnard into the modified unified school district. But a part of this was going through the articles of agreement here and removing what was no longer appropriate, some of the original Act 46 language that because we've already merged is, is no longer appropriate building into it uh, the policies that have been approved for closure, for reorganization, um, so that that is clarified in the articles and removing, again, some of the language that had been in there during the Act 46 period, and to be able to bring that to this board. Now, this board doesn't need to uh, vote to accept the articles of, of organization. It's really just, in effect, an endorsement that we're in agreement for bringing this forward. Uh, at which time Barnard meets with the State Education Board with the new articles and then has their vote and it then comes back to ours. So what I'll apologize with is our color printer um, was challenged tonight. So I only have 14 copies that are in color. I know we have uh, 16 members here if you just wouldn't mind sharing for those that cannot and then we will. And just um, historically for all of you as a reminder, Jennifer and I sat down with the Barnard Board from the elementary school to go over things that were important to do. Um, and we agreed that we needed to make sure that as a policy-driven board that our policies were written first and then that the articles of agreement supported the policies that um, were approved by the full board so that we were not negotiating um, articles of organization for individual towns but that we were looking at it as a whole that that was incredibly important to all of us since seven towns have voted yes to join us as Act 46 and Barnard was the one town that held back on that vote um, that we couldn't just negotiate singly, um, but it was supposed to support the whole, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's why more so this policy needs to go hand in hand with, with the articles, the articles um, so that it reads correctly for the whole district. So what you'll find in the markups that you have, and for those that didn't get one, I'll be sure that Jerry gets a copy to share with board members, is what has been eliminated really is language. It's no longer timely, it's no longer appropriate for us. And what has been added is absolutely consistent with the policies as they were written. The only, the only sentence that is inconsistent with policy is the one we've now been discussing. So it has changed from the one, from the language that, that, that Jim shared, and it's now the language that speaks to the, um, a need for one of two board members from the effective <coughs> to vote in favor of anything having to do with Can you district. point to us which page that's that you're talking about? Yes. There's a suggestion that something change. Well, is it on this, is it in this? It is in this one, Jim, and it is, it is in Article 15, and it's the last sentence of the first paragraph of Article 15. Any vote to restructure an elementary school for the purpose of supporting new educational initiatives will require a majority vote, which includes at least 50% of the board members representing the affected town. And again, the reason that we're sharing this today is there's a bit of an impasse between uh, the SU on the, the discussion negotiation and Barnard on the discussion and negotiation. Um, so really looking for direction from the board of how to try and take this if we're still trying to uh, um, undertake a vote by Barter to to join the mud in the time frame. Yeah, if I could fill in the, the, the stories before questions, is that okay? For Barter, sure. Okay. I mean, I'm just, it says presenting, so I'm just, I see hands, I'm just saying, should I wait? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I really want to recognize how incredibly helpful Richard has been in this process. Um, just super fair and even keeled, and, and uh, we've been working really hard on this. Um, and I think that needs to be said because I know it's kind of tedious and it's kind of a pain and you're probably sick and tired of hearing about it and I get it. So am I, but, um, but we're really close to something. And I, I guess, you know, from the from uh, Corinne Park, the Barnard School Board Chair, and myself are the 721 Committee for Barnard. That's what kind of merger it would be. Um, we, uh, at Bob Fletcher, the month's lawyers, um, he said, let's get this whole thing started by you sending these revised, these suggested revisions to the Articles of Agreement. This is what we worked with the Barnard lawyer to come up with. And um, and then we haven't heard back. We sent that three, about three and a half weeks ago. And we haven't heard back, and, and I'm presuming the reason that, that we haven't heard back is because what we suggested raised a procedural question because it, we never discussed um, uh, when we said, hey, let's try this out and let's go through policy first and all of that, we never discussed, well, what's going to happen if not all of Barnard's concerns are addressed through policy? Because uh, Corinne and I were very clear from the very beginning that uh, we distilled our concerns down to three major concerns that had to be resolved before we would bring this to voters. And um, uh, the, uh, we're like at two and a half now. So uh, pre-K was one of them, done, check, wonderful. Closure was one of them, the new policy is, is very fair, check, done, great. And then the restructuring one is really, really important to our voters, not just to us. We have heard it from so many people. Um, so, um, so obviously the decision to, this intersects very much with the thing we were just talking about, um, the fact that this board is, um, willing to bring that conversation back to the policy committee. It's a little confusing and the timing is confusing, but that does show the flexibility and I think that Corinne and I would have to talk about that at this point because our timeline is really, really short at this point. So um, I just think uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a lot of work. There's been a lot of good support. Um, thank you, Mary Beth, also for coming to our meeting the other night and answering questions. That was really helpful. Um, and I, I think you know, this could this could all fall into place very quickly, um, but we are in a little bit of a question, the question, the procedural question that exists now. I'm sorry, this is my last little 30 seconds or less. Um, this negotiation, because of the way that the board wanted it to go, where it was based on policy only, did not uh, was not a traditional negotiation where sides are asking for things and going back and forth. So because this is this restructuring thing is not in policy. One question we have for this board is, are you willing to have a traditional negotiation? I think what Paige just said means no, not. No. You do not want for Barnard to ask for something because of the way that you feel it's no, important. No, because we, because Jennifer and I sat down with Corinne to discuss the three points that you are talking about. Um, and we, we said that we are not negotiating for a single town. We are negotiating for all towns involved in Act 46. That was our conversation that took place very early on. And we stated very clearly that it would be written in policy first, supported by the entire board, and then we would adjust the articles to support the policies that were agreed upon, that we would not rewrite anything for one individual town only, that that was unfair to the existing seven towns that had already voted yes. So, so, so Brian and I are asking you, are you sticking to that? Is there any yes, for because the okay. full board should be voting at this point on how, on how they want to proceed with this. And, and they just said they want to revise and look at the policy and, and, and how that will affect this. We've made that very clear, Jennifer and I, to I, I There's no confusion there, it's a request. Right, but I, Jen? So, 
we all understood at some point that Warner was asking for changes, okay? And they wanted these three items changed. We as a full board had said what Paige just said. I'm not going to repeat it, okay? That's what we voted on. What we voted also on was is to send back, and this started in policy committee. Lou, you were, you were involved in this, where we agreed to have Richard get our counsel and Barnes counsel to go through this document to make the certain little changes that needed to be done, not to really add anything else in once again. And going with the basis of that this is all one unified district, and that's what we're supposed to go to, I would just like to point this all to Article 5. Because I, I have a problem with that. The last sentence, I believe, it says, the board shall honor all individual employment contracts and seniority is in red that are in place in the Barnett School District on June 30th, 2020 until their respective termination dates. Now, I just received this. I'm just going through it fast. But if we're all one district, and we're all one, how does one school's teachers or staff seniority overrule everyone else? Time, this is the document that would be the basis for Barnard's ballot. This isn't for everyone. It, it would, the articles of agreement for everyone would be similar to this, but would not have the language sing, sing, singling out a town like that. Well, well this, no, this, no, this, this article states Specifically, yeah. I'm, I'm really confused. What, what are two documents? This is a working document yeah. that has to do with the uh, creation of a ballot for Barnard. And it's a little different from the last merger where everyone's going to have, I mean, yes, the articles for the entire unified district would be, would be revised as well. But this document is being made with Barnard's ballot construction in mind. So That's why it says Barnard. It will not say that for everyone. So right, Richard? Do you understand what I'm saying? I hear what you're saying, but I'm, I'm confused by what you're saying. I thought that we were updating the Articles of Agreement for WCM UUSD. And uh, there wasn't one for Barn and one for another. There was a single articles and agreement. So you're on the, the same way. I'm on the same so, way. So, so if we're doing that, then that's a typo. Okay. I mean, either way, it's not. It's not uh, anything to be concerned about because it's. So, but then I would go back to then your time, your future board's hands that say that your articles of agreement in your separate Barnard articles of agreement, which I don't think any of us have separate articles of agreement would state that any of your future board members will honor all individual contracts and seniority. I don't know how you would do that if we're all on. Hold on, hold on, guys. Calm down. The articles are the articles. There's no confusion. Maybe some wording is just said wrong. We're changing. We would be sending out to the public to change the articles for this merged board. I think that what happened in some of the writing is they're framing it as to how it be presented to the buyer the public. And so Barnard was used in some cases. When this goes to vote, it is not going to say Barnard. When it goes to all the towns, it as a ballot item. That, that's what she's saying. So they're, they're, they're thinking of the context that it's going to, to Barnard voters. So that's probably why it says Barnard. Well, then they should get one about before we vote. It should. It should be clean. Because if we vote on this one again tonight, that means it's voted. Yeah, 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 yeah. And really, if, if I could, the language here is consistent with the way we have brought all teachers and everyone into our negotiated agreements. So if we bring another school into the negotiated agreement, seniority from that school just meshes in with the seniority of the other schools. I hear, I hear how you're interpreting it, Jim, and that's a, a point for to clarify. I understand what this is, right? We shouldn't worry about this document. This is for Barnard only. This is not a for all of us, right? Correct. It's a working document. Exactly. But it's for Barnard residents three to understand the changes that are going to happen for Barnard. Is that right? Ultimately, this board will be endorsing Barnard doing this because Barnard cannot go to the SBD and said, we're joining the Windsor Central and we haven't asked them if they want us. Right. So, so I, I understand what so you're saying. So this is not like something we need to argue about once. Yeah. 
Yeah. Are you bored with that? Because the idea is going to come back to us in a while. Yes. I do have a question for you. Okay. We have three key points that we've worked on in the boss of You say we're at two and a half out of three. Why change the process now? I'm, the, I'm not. Okay. We have said this from day one that there was there was three. Yeah, no, I get that. But why why do you want to negotiate outside of the policy committee now by having a negotiation directly with the leaders of the board instead of the policy committee? Is there like a reason for that? Yes. I, I'm reason? sorry. I thought I explained that. The reason for that is is that we have never discussed what do we do if we reach. I don't necessarily want to use this word. I don't mean it legally, but an impasse. What do we do? Because Barnard is not. Uh, does not feel satisfied at this point. So the we're so like two and, and a half out of three, right? We're two and a half out of three. And so now you want to change the process. No, I no, 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 no. Well, you can call it change the process. We did not. We had three things that that were musts that we had to have to bring this to our voters. We don't have that. So now we're saying, okay, do we just just throw all this hard work in the garbage and walk away? We don't want to do that. So we're trying to look for an answer. Can we change the process where Barnard is allowed to ask for something? And if the answer is no, that's fine. You know, then we move on. But uh, I don't see it as a change. It, it, it's because we're responding to what has transpired. And that's part of the process. Um, I just want to, you know, I want to mention perhaps why people are, are looking at this tonight for for those of us who haven't seen the articles of organization as um, sort of with proposed amendments to the Midrat, why there might be confusion or why there, it might, we might sound a little alarmed is I think it was certainly my impression that any work that would be done on these articles of organization would be to clean them up, but not to alter them. And so I think that <clears throat> What, you know, there are a couple of things in here, certainly, um, you know, the language that was proposed for the policy tonight and a couple of other things that appear to change them. And I think when, when, um, you know, I, I, I certainly don't want you to understand it to be, and, and you know, that this board doesn't want to work or negotiate with Pompey or with Barber. That is, that's certainly not my intention. My intention has always been to find a way that Barnard can come up. I mean, this is, that is, it should be everybody's goal at this table. Um, but I think, you know, my recollection of this was very much in, in my meeting, in our meeting with Corinne, you know, we want to come in, but we don't think it's fair at this point to modify these substantially in any sort of substantive way, um, other than just cleaning them up, things that aren't relevant anymore. But that it's not fair to towns that already voted to have, you know, substantial change. Um, so I think that's why, and I understand. I mean, I'm sure your lawyer looked at it and with his or her eyes thought, what's everything that I can put in here? I mean, I, I have to completely understand it. But I think, um, you know, I, I'm interested, Richard, certainly with your with your move coming up, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in how we proceed forward and, and who's taking charge of this when Richard is in here. Yeah, because I really value the work that you've done on it. I can hear it from, from Pamela, and the board really appreciates this because clearly there's a lot of work going into this. And what's, what's our plan? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I, I want to echo thanks to Richard, who has worked really, really hard on this project and worked with attorneys to try to get us to a place where we can get um, a resolution that works for everybody. Um, Richard, this will be your last board meeting of your tenure here. What I would like to do, and I was remiss at the beginning of the meeting not to do this, Mike, if you're back there, I guess he's engaged. Mike. Mike. <laughs> and I'll Um, and I know that we're excited to have Mike on board and Richard is mentoring him in order to be sure you're ready to hit the ground running. Mike comes with a ton of experience from the private sector, very, very strong in finance. Um, so I, I did want to make sure that everybody could put a face to the name. Uh, Mike and Ceci, everybody. 
um, and then what I'd like to do, so thank you, and um, we appreciate all the good work that are we doing for us, Mike, so thank you. Um, what I think we're going to have to do is to have a, a situation that probably Mike and I will be working together on this because I have more of a background around this issue, um, and then Mike will be the person I'll be talking with council and we'll work that out. Um, so that we'll be able to cover it um, because Richard and I have any close communication on this issue. He's been doing a lot of the work, but I do understand what's been going on, so maybe we'll jump in. Okay. Great. Great. Is there a board involvement in that process? Because, I mean, I mean, to me, this is maybe a negotiation document, but it's not its not a document that we should even be looking at at this point. So is there, is there in, in terms of like where the policy committee is doing its work, which is related, um, you know, here's here's the outcome of a proposed amendment policy that hasn't been even really considered, and it's inside of the articles of agreement. So I just want to make sure that we have this coordinated between board and staff. Well, it's not really it's inside, inside the articles of organization. Well, it's, it's inside this, this document right, but, that's going back and forth well, on this specific I document. think it's just important to get clarity on what this document is. Um, and and I, I just, in some ways, I feel like I, I have to re-anchor on this. And that is, it would be a travesty, an absolute travesty, to include this proposed poly, poly, policy provision in the article of incorporation. A travesty the community of Reading, about to be a travesty the community of Concord, based on your recommendations you're just about to make, to include this now, which is essentially you know, a protection for the, for the community of Barnard. It just doesn't make sense. So, well, that's and all. Bob, can I just comment on that? And, and Pamela, we, we've had these conversations back and forth in the negotiation process with Corinne. Um, and sometimes in negotiations, you're going to get a flat out no. We're, we're, not, going, we're not going to do this. Um, and, and honestly, part of that negotiation was we would like to have that policy written first and foremost and approved by the full board. And then this document um, would, would hopefully support that. And that's really what Jennifer and I are trying to get at, is that no, we're not gonna renegotiate this point. We are going to send it back to policy um, to re-look at that policy like we've agreed from the board and then look at how this paragraph should read um, that's the negotiation and sometimes negotiations take that turn where it's just no we're, we're not negotiating um, for that particular area there's two points that I think really need to be addressed. One is that I understand that looking, um, Jennifer just said about looking at all these changes, the only things in there that actually change substantively are articles 13 and 15, and they are based on policy conversations. Hence why you're going back to policy. No, I just, uh, there's, um, Jennifer was speaking about how, some, how many substantial changes there are, and there actually really are, it just looks like it, because there's a lot of changes of dates and, and things like that. And since, you know, it did be, we didn't become a unified district, we became a modified district, you know, Pittsfield, et cetera. So there's a lot of changes, but it's not actually that substantial. The other thing is, is what Bob just said, it sort of contradicts, um, I'm getting mixed messages that that is going to be a kind of position of the board because um, we were charged with working with policy and then making sure that any policy changes that happened could be, you know, would, would not conflict with articles and those articles on closure and restructuring would change. But Bob and sounds I, and like I he is. But Bob sounds like he is having a problem with those changing at all. No, which, just, no, no. Just one. He, which one? The one that you the wrote this evening that is now incorporated in this negotiation document. Can I? Can I just for a second? Okay. Bob, what? Yeah. This is. This is a. This is. This is atypical to have both sides of the negotiation discussing in public the different sides of negotiation and what you actually have. What you've got here is a work in process. This is not a recommendation that came from me that said, please accept this. This is where it currently stands, and the issue related to that one sentence, I didn't have the authority to say what Paige just did, which is no. 
so the reason to come here, but it's just odd to have this discussion in public with both sides here, as it was at the policy committee with both sides of the policy committee. This isn't a recommendation. I wanted to raise the issue that everything is really consistent to policy, almost verbatim, except for that one sentence. And we're getting clarity now on what we do with that one sentence. Then we have the calendar against which we're trying to work for Barnard to have their vote. Bryce, I'm going to take one last question and then we're going to move on. So I just want to frame this from my point of view because I'm not on the committee with the panel, so um, a lot of the stuff I also see the first time with you guys. Um, for me, it's, it's the more broad issue of, because Barnard could still vote not join no matter what we do, right? And for me, it's more of an issue about policy versus articles and um, establishing something more into articles than were there. It's the whole reason why I voted no a couple years ago to have Barnard join, was because I was uh, skeptical of the articles and thought they needed to be a little bit more detailed. So whatever it ends up being, whatever policy we decide, whether we change it or don't change it, that entering and becoming an article and going out to the voters to vote and readopt these new articles um, affords a set of protections for, for all towns that I think that at least the voters might be interested in reading and having a chance to, to vote on whether they want those or not. So even Barnard aside, again, every community might have those ideas. I mean, I had somebody in Woodstock last year say they had this fear that the other small towns were gonna gang up and vote to close West, right? Because that, that technically could happen right now and you would actually need no justification. You'd say they all go to the outside schools and that's equal to everybody and West is closed and we're gonna save much money. So without any kind of systems in place, um, that kind of can happen. So I like the sustainability policy because it's outlined very thoroughly. Um, and like I said, in, in this policy, that, that I'm leaving it a little too open-ended because it's an or, it's not the end. It's saying there's this whole other policy that, that could cause this to happen or because we want to do something educationally. And I just think that's too, too vague. And I think if we're, every town involved, the voters should be able to decide whether they want to adopt a new article. The reason for them wanting, wanting to adopt the article potentially is because when we get a new board every March, right, we have new representatives, the new board could come in and say, I move to get rid of this policy, and then we could all say aye, and the policy goes away, and then we can close the school, right? And if it's an article, it has to go back to the townspeople of the whole group, of, of which, you know, Woodstock has more people than anybody. That's, I, I have no problem with that. You know, but, but at least it's going to the electorate as a whole, and I think that's more fair when we're talking about such heavy things. And then that's why it's the article for those couple of topics. Okay. Adam, last question. Sorry, then we're moving on. Yeah, I think I just want to commend that <coughs> the conversation that's happening. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I think there's probably, probably plenty of people in Reading that are pretty envious of the advocacy <coughs> that Barnard is doing. They've seen what's happened in this process of this complicated process of bringing multiple towns together into a unified district how we voted without a policy to change the school, right? So I absolutely commend, Bob, despite what you're saying, and I think and most people in Reading would that voted against the merge was, um, they wanna make sure that they're not gonna, within one year of being part of a unified district, that their school's gonna significantly change. So good on you and, and the people that you guys have organized, and I think, it, I'm sorry that it's a frustrating negotiation process, but this is a complicated process, and I, we just can't rush anything. I'm not saying to rush it. What I'm saying is that the agreement was to negotiate the items that were important on both sides of the table and to set the policy to support that conversation first and then to amend the articles second, um, secondly so that you did a process. That's, that's all I'm saying and for some reason we're, we're reversing that process. And I don't think that, as Lou said, we should be reversing, we should be reversing that process. That's my concern, is that we had specifically talked about these three agenda items. I want it to go back to policy first, and then I want this to be adjusted to support whatever the policy is that this full board supports to then be written into this. That, that's my concern, is that we shouldn't be altering the process in discussion. Um, 
that that's how I'm looking at it, Pamela. I understand. I think it should be said for the record that it keeps on involved in negotiation, and it's not really a negotiation. It was a, a process that we all decided to try, and we agreed to tr try it, but it has not yielded a result that, that we said, yet, and it still could, uh, that we said was important after working on this for like three years uh, to our voters. And we right. are so representing people, so it's important to us. And all we're saying is it gets to the point like, okay, can we ask for something? No, we can't. So that means it's but not a negotiation. You've asked for two things that yes, we agreed to um, already. No, the pre k just happened, which was great. We didn't ask for it. This has been a long process in policy. This discussion really should be taking place at least tonight because we've already said in our last vote that we were going back to policy to have that one discussion. And, and we'll see what comes out of there. If something comes out of there differently than what it is, and we come back here and vote as a whole, and it's into the favor of the whole district, which pleases Barnard, then we're not having this discussion. Right now we're having a discussion. This is it's true. I, I just object to it being on the change when, when in, process, in complex uh, processes, of course there are changes. That is not such a big but, but Mela, I understand where you're coming yeah. from. And this is why we're, we're having another shot at another policy meeting to do it. And everybody on this board agreed to that. I appreciate that. And, and I also just want to say is that, you know, we keep on saying, or you keep on saying, this is not a negotiation. But it is a negotiation of somebody sitting at a table and saying, if I don't get my way, we're not going to put this up for a vote in our town. And I don't think that if Jennifer and I were on this argument here, that once if we got so close to two and a half or whatever, that if we were the deciding ones to say, we are not going to put this to vote to our voters, we're doing our voters a disservice. We should at least take what we've come to and give the vote like we said to the voters and at least then let this full board hear a soundingly yes or a no. And that's where I have a problem with where the conversation is going of two board members saying, I will not put this forward. And that's what one said the other day. I didn't say I would tell people to vote no on it, Jim. I would tell people, I would say that we're not putting it to a vote. And you've said that again here tonight. And I don't think any board member, we are only 18 people out of how many thousands of people? Actually, this is not true. Because there were several items that we had talked about early on, like board composition. We were told by many people on this board and administration that that was a non-starter. So if this board can have non-starters, so can Barner. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a normal part of of the process. Do you agree that this one thing that's holding you up to put to your town for voters is right now on the table to go back to the policy committee to try to work something out? Yes, I do, and I would Okay, so then why are we having an argument? Let's just take the table. Let's table. I feel like we're having this conversation. I feel like we should move on. You know, let's just, let's leave on a positive note that we're going back into policy. And, and we will have our discussion there. And maybe, maybe at some point, Barnett can work some kind of language up that will work into what, maybe what I'm looking for and what Lou's looking for to bring forward to everyone. And I'm sure that you've done a great job on everything else here, and we've gotten this far, that you might be able to pull this one off also for your town. It's not I give you the go. Time, but well, yeah. it is because you're telling us this. Okay, we can, we can leave. I'm just, I'm just frustrated because I feel like I have been acting, I know I've been acting in good faith, I have been working my butt off, and I feel like people are pissed at me, and that's frustrating. No, 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 no not at all. Sorry, that's, 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 that, that, that's not the case. Okay. I think what's happening right now is the conversation is circling, and, it, right. and the same conversation is circling. We, we agree with the, with sending it back to policy, like Jim said. Okay. Let's just get the prop. Put it back into process. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Everybody take a breath, stand up, stretch for a second. All right, we're moving on. So Mary Beth is going to present different recommendations on the use 
of the Prosper Valley facility. And I know that on last Thursday, the campus configurations um, committee had a meeting at the Pomfret Town Hall, and it was long. Uh, it it was um, a good meeting where people were heard from Pomfret. Um, it was an important meeting for the Pomfret people to be heard. Um, by the campus configurations group. We have a lot of work ahead of us before um, before any vote. And honestly, I know that everybody feels like we gotta go, go, go and make a decision quickly. Um, but I, I think we've got to make sure that we make the decisions for the right reasons in, in how we proceed. Um, we have heard what Joe's assessment of the building has been, um, and I, I really respect Joe and the amount of work he's, he's done on the, the Pomfret School. I think everybody doesn't disagree with me on that. Um, and, and so we're going to move forward with where Mary Beth sees things. Um, and, and how we should move forward. It's it's not an easy, easy conversation, no matter how we slice or dice it. And um, this is where we make hard decisions, and they're just hard. That's all I can say. They're hard. They're emotional. They're um, <clears throat> there's probably no right answer that's going to satisfy every single people in a room, to be quite honest with you. There's just not. Um, and that's just the truth of the matter. And so I'm going to let Mary Beth take over. And I'm going to move over to a comfortable chair and watch this. Can I just add Mary Beth? Just, just from being at the meeting last Thursday, I'm hoping that people are listening and, and hearing these things. I think what really came out of it for me is that there are two different things that I don't want to get confused and one is um, you know repairing the building and the usability of the facility and then what is her suggestion for what we're going to use that for but I don't I feel like it's tangled up a lot where people are thinking well maybe you know we're going to let the building go bad or something versus she's talking about a specific proposal for the use of the building not necessarily whether it's being repaired or what it's like. there's two different aspects I guess does that make sense yeah no I think that, that that's absolutely true Bryce. And, um, you know, at the last meeting, the board charged me to come back with a recommendation um, in my role as superintendent as to what, what I think um, would make sense for the building. Um, I would echo Paige's comments that it is, there's no easy answer. I, I know whatever answer I give, I'm going to upset somebody, um, and that's hard. Um, so I, I have done the absolute best I can to, to, to offer a recommendation that comes from looking at all that I see happening in the district and what I believe is in the best interest of all of our students. Um, and one quick thing, just to kind of just a slight visual here that many people kind of go around, but one of the things that we did internally as a leadership team is that we took the document that was created last year and the board voted on around the 19 strategic goals and we came up with our kind of our coherence plan. Who's working on what? Right? And when you look at this, you will see that the green are some of the central office functions. Um, we have teachers in certain grade levels working on the academic foundations. We have teachers working on social emotional. We have teachers doing some R and D. Um, and so facility improvements here is here in this one box, right? And it's very important, but it's one of many things that this board has asked us to accomplish this year. And, and these, these particular issues can become very, very emotional and very, very difficult. Um, but I wanted to just kind of remind the board that this is the scope of the work that we, you have indicated to us you want us to take on this year. Um, so that's, that's one piece. Um, when we start thinking about timeline and and, and how we can best process this. Um, the next piece is that even within the facility improvement piece, 
We have Prosper Valley, which currently, if you're looking at um, Joe's report, is about a half million dollars. At the same time, we're looking at a, a really significant um, challenge at our middle school and high school. But a lot of conversation that that building is not lived its useful life. And that can be anywhere in the range of 55 to 65 million dollars. And then we have other elementary projects to three to four million dollars. So I'm offering all of this in context of what I see collectively. Um, and it, it is absolutely both for communities and for the board. And honestly, from central office, drinking from the fire hose, trying to make all of the pieces fit and make sense. Um, so I, I offer that as just a, a frame of reference. Um, one of the things that I would offer, this is certainly up to the board as to whether or not this makes sense to them, to you, but um, today's conversation is to discuss and um, have a discussion about the recommendation that you asked me to bring forward. And then the configuration committee is actually the committee, the committee that comes back and makes a formal recommendation to the board. But given the, the challenges that we have with time and thinking about budget and some of these other pieces, it might be helpful for the configuration committee to get some real feedback from the board about what um, recommendations feel viable and which do not, um, just in terms of, of focusing work. Um, configuration committee, um, we will not meet again until October 14th, so that gives the committee some time to regroup. Um, the, currently the way our work plan is, is that the board would hear the formal recommendation of the configuration committee on the 14th and then potentially vote in, on around October 28th as to how it wants to proceed. So that, that's the, the tentative timeline that I would put out to the board and, and how we're currently operating. Um, again, the board, board will choose to make um, adjustments to that. Um, so, I have sent all of you, and it's in the board packet, my formal report around the, the recommendation that, that I would put forth for, for the building. Um, there, um, one of the things that I, I wanted to share very briefly, I felt it was a really fair question for the people of, of Pomfret um, to ask why not put it back the way that it was. Um, so that what, one of the pieces of information I included in your report was enrollment figures. Um, and I, I think that probably the most good, just kind of cutting to the chase around this, on the second page of the report, um, if you look at the projected um, enrollment at Prosper Valley combining Bridgewater and Pompton students that have not already um, made school choice decisions, the total enrollment for the school would be 42 students. And that would mean that you would be combining K and 1, and combining 2 and 3, and you would have to combine 4 through 6, which is, I think the board is already in discussion about combining three different grade levels and the educational challenges associated with that. Um, so that, so my recommendation is not to put Prosper Valley back the way that it was because of the significant enrollments that have occurred and to put it back even by combining classrooms gets us into a situation that I don't think anybody feels is educationally optimal. Uh, um, Mary, Mary, do you have a question? Just because it's, it goes to what you're saying right now. Sure. What, and I was not at the Thursday meeting, I was out of town, um, and I would say to anybody that wasn't at the Thursday meeting, if they want to know everything that was said, it was there's a recording available of that meeting, so you can really get the public comment. That's going to be hard for people to comment back up tonight. But wasn't the, a bigger question, like, why not put the 5-6 back? You know, why not put 5 and 6 back into that building as a, as a combined Reading student, Woodstock student, Comfort Bridgewater, with respect to Reading, you know, however easily it made fewer transfers for the Reading students, wasn't that the more common question versus putting it back? I mean, I don't think anyone in Comfort really believes it's going back as a K-6, and if anybody was at that meeting and they could confirm that, with, is that not true, that more people were like, hey, why are we not going back yeah, to that recommendation that we had a whole meeting about? Yeah, so we will get there. Uh, you know, what I'm doing is walking Okay. as I have and I it felt to me that it was a fair question as to why when you close Prosper Valley why wouldn't you restore it 
sort of there was before. And so those numbers are there in answering that question. Um, so the, the recommendation that I put forth, and then I'd be happy to speak to um, so, you know, some of the other ideas that have been put out there and, and a lot that I think about. Um, but when I, when I sat down to make this recommendation, there were a number of things that I thought about. Um, and that, those are outlined in your memo that, first and foremost, the education needs of all of our students, um, looking at the impact on the budget, looking at the impact on the, the Pompano community, what's the alignment with our strategic plan. I right? spent a lot of time putting together a strategic plan and the capacity issues at us. Um, so my, my recommendation at this point, and I, I would offer two versions of it, um, one is to simply move the pre-K from West over to Pomfret and open up a second, a second pre-K section. And if you remember last um, spring, the, the board asked me to see if it was possible to open up a second pre-K uh, section at West. We did not have the space to do it. We turned away about 20 families that were interested in receiving that service from the district. Um, and so this would enable us to limit the amounts of, of changes from the district <laughs> because people travel for pre-K anyways. Um, and that it would also enable us to um, serve the approximately 20 families that had requested um, to participate in our, our interest that colleges and universities are speaking to us about is to actually start to house higher education programs here. I can't speak in detail about that. We have some meetings coming up and I'll have some, some greater clarification. But that, that, that has a lot of potential benefits to the district, including um, a revenue enhancement um, and to be able to actually bring revenue into the district. Um, and then finally, the, the outdoor campus, um, certainly Prosper Valley has a, a beautiful outdoor campus, um, some, some beautiful trails, and, um, it's, it's the observatory there, so the, that preserving that and looking for ways in which that can be a resource um, across the district would, would be part of that recommendation. Um, very quickly, in terms of the educational benefits, this recommendation maintains single grade level structures for both West and Prosper Valley, so it's first grade, second grade, and we're not trying to combine classes. Um, it uh, enables um, us to build out space that's been designed for, for pre-K that, um, that follows the regulations if we're, if we're making some of the remediations. Um, and that that half of the building is actually already um, set up for younger children and pre-K students. Um, it provides teams of teachers for collaboration and partnering. And it, it is also close to our student jobs and number of programs. Um, depending, you know, the, the, one of the other options could be to also move kindergarten that has some other complexities related to it, but that is something that the board can consider. Um, the impact on the budget is that it is revenue neutral. Um, that um, looking at a number of the challenges, including potentially the 550,000 for mediation, um, looking at what's been proposed here would not. Um, bring any new cost to the district. Um, with pre-K, we don't have to work with some of the challenges related to special subject teachers, and the partnership with higher ed, as I mentioned, could not only be, be revenue neutral, but could potentially generate revenue. Um, impact in terms of the public community is that you know, one of the things that, that I've certainly heard is that getting that building open is incredibly important to the public community. Um, so this, this, this plan gets us building up and operational for next year. Um, free public pre-K um, is, a, is a significant draw for this district. Um, we are one of the few districts in the state that offer this service and, and the public community having that resource is something that appears to be a value to the community and that it continues to acknowledge the value of the outdoor campus. Um, a lot of the strategic plan is um, establishing stewardship experiences, so that has to do with the outdoor campus, 
um, remediating facility deficiencies, so that, that's certainly part, and then becoming a destination for regional and national level professional learning, so at least that um, right now, WES, I would say, is at capacity, so it, it would eliminate one to three classrooms. One of the concerns that, that I hear a lot from the principal is to pick up drop-off related to pre-K, so that, you know, that solves that particular issue. Um, and then looking at, in terms of funding this, um, if we look to do a bond this fall, it adds about a, um, a penny on the tax rate, or about $25 to a house that is valued at a thousand. So that is my recommendation. I can answer questions related to that, or I can talk about some of the other ideas that have been What's the will of the board on that? Very good. What's a, sorry, just on your um, bond impact, are you talking about the 550 to remediate the building? Yes, the 550, if you were to go out with the bond to remediate the building um, with the plan to reopen it in the fall, it, it would have about a penny impact um, on the, the tax rate, which turns out to be about $25 on a house that's valued at about 300000 right. for okay. people that are paying the property tax rate. Not the right, tax understood. Rate. What, uh, and so this all assumes successful remediation of current old issues in the, in the okay. facility? So it's a really a matter of if we can, if our plans are successful, if everything goes as planned in the fall, this is what the building would be used for. Yes, and you know where, where, what, what Joe has shared, and, and Richard, feel free to jump in here, is that it, it certainly would be a tight time frame. Mm -hmm. um, but currently, he feels like he could he could make that happen, and that the the current feeling in terms of the effectiveness of the remediation is a 90 to 95 percent. Um, confidence rate that it would be successful. Richard, anything to add to that? I guess, what kind of time frame are we looking at in terms of like a go, no go decision for you know, putting human beings back in that building? Well, the, the intent would be to move forward and to plan to reopen it in the fall. Okay. You know, I, I know that's the plan. I'm just trying to, what's the, uh, like this is a, seems all well thought out and well intended. Just as a board, I want to uh, kind of be mindful of. Uh, the uh, potential that we may get to or you know, close to that point in time and the mold count may not have come down, the radiation may not have been successful. We don't want to put all our eggs in a basket or you know, make a board decision on something and then kind of go. Yeah, one of the things that, that this does is it does give the flexibility sh should that occur. Okay. You know, um, because we, we currently have one three day um, so that, that we would not have to do keep that as it is and we just wouldn't open up a second pre-k. Um, I wonder if I'm thinking that out a little bit further, you know, families do make decisions about pre-k in April, so I think that we would have to put out to families that were opening it a section. Um, I don't think that we would have all the efforts done at that point with, with the quality test. Certainly not in April, but the, we can get it completed by the end of August, which is the time for the building to be back up and people in there. Okay. So Mary, uh, mm -hmm. I was at the meeting the other day also. And one of the things that the folks were talking about is waiting until a watch for the building would put us into this predicament mm -hmm. that we may not know. And that if if this position here, forget about what the option is for the building at this time. The number one thing is will the building be able to open? So why don't we spend the five hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Or as some people have said, take the seventy thousand or whatever if it's there, and get the water off first and do all you know, and I would think that we would get the water off first and before we did any testing or whatever. There's no sense of testing the pool that has water in it at the top if there's a leak on the bottom. I get that, okay? But why aren't we not moving forward saying that we have these numbers in front of us? recommendation is to, your recommendation no matter what at this point is to try to reopen that building. Yes. There's a 90 to 95 percent chance that what we do will take care of this situation. Okay. Until we know that 90 to 95 percent is 100, 
would we be better off if this is what the board wants to move forward on, okay, to say that we need to have a vote sooner than March and maybe have the vote in November or December and that way things can take place and then you'll be able to let parents know or whoever, whatever plan comes up with that this building is open and it's ready to go and then we can have all this other conversation or whatever. If we, you know, we go to a parent and say, we're going to move kindergarten over here now, but we don't know until we really have a March, the first, you have vote the first Tuesday of March, voters say yes on the bond, there's 30 days for anyone to contest the vote, you got to wait until April, and then you got to start doing the bond letter. So you're really not going to have the money until late April, and, you and can, then you're going to start doing this And you can call a special meeting. And you can call, and so that was one of the discussions that was in the meeting, that why I think Bob back there always has a computer with them. Bob, right? Okay. Um, I think that was one of his suggestions at that time, is that why are we waiting until March? One, if this is what we want to do first, and open the school up, that's $550,000 over 30 years? Eight. Eight? Okay, that's why it's a penny. All right. So over eight years, um, then wouldn't that be the first step first before we touch bases with any higher education or any parents or anyone else saying this is what we, you know, we want to make sure the school is, is, is fixed. That's, that's our number one. Yeah, and I think absolutely we have to be, be sure that the, the building is ready to open. There, there is a, a very high confidence back in the will. I don't know, Richard, if you could speak to, and again, you know, it's always that balance, right? Some of the challenges that, that, that that you d described around trying to do something piecemeal as opposed to doing a whole lot of project at once. And I don't have anything that you want to offer there. Well, I mean, this is, everyone has different experiences on doing a project. But doing it all together rather than phase by phase normally will be a less expensive way of getting a project done. As opposed to doing one, testing it, bringing it back in for the next, bringing it back in for the next. I understand, and Bob shared also, and why don't we just get the drains done and see what it looks like? And once you get the drains done, you know, then you can do the dehumidification, then you can do the flooring. And again, if we have an agreement on moving forward, uh, the recommendation is to move forward. Let's get this project put together. Let's take care of the drains. Let's take care of the water. Let's take care of the dehumidification, the floor, the whole thing, and put it back into use. Um, and whether that be done on town meeting day in March or done earlier, I, I don't really have an opinion. The more time it's available, the better. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Now, Melina has her hand up. Hold on. Melina's first. She had her hand up. I just want to piggyback on Jim. Uh, you mentioned challenges with time, and I think we have quite a few, one being the budget, one reason for having this discussion now. But then if we're going to open this building up to little ones, and we wait until March, and we're going to have pre-K in there. There's a licensing process that goes along with that too. And so, are we going to have enough time, you know, to, to open the doors for pre-K and being licensed at that school? Because I don't think it's licensed for pre-K right now. Is it? It's not. It's not. Yeah. So we would have to get started on that process. There's a lot that yeah. we can do in advance. Yeah. Um, so, you know, absolutely. You know, one of the things I would absolutely say to the board: this is a tight time time schedule. One of the challenges that, you know, in terms of the, the funding of this is that we, we don't currently have $550,000 in this budget. would have to go up to a bond. And we don't yet know in terms of what the, the impact is going to be in terms of the, the other pieces of this budget. Um, so if the, if the board was comfortable, you could go out and ask for a bond now. Um, without that other piece of information, I don't know whether or not communities would want that other piece of information before they open it. Hold on. Matt, Matt. Thank you. So, speaking from town, we don't really have a school. We 
have been bouncing around, moved. Um, I've always been for reopening the school in any capacity. I really like to, <clears throat> I mean, Mary Beth is obviously put a lot of work into this. Personally, like, I, I get trying to get revenue, but I think it's going to irritate, and I know it already does because I've seen some of the faces out here, that you're putting in adult educational things in our school. I mean, I know that this is Paul Fritz school. We were asked. Prosper Valley School. Well, now it's Prosper Valley School. So, um, you know, I, I question whether or not the observatory, all the land, is really going to be used to its maximum potential when you don't actually have, you know, the sixth grade there that is using the observatory. Um, you know, they were out back. I mean, I, you're going to send the Triple E kids roaming around in the woods? Probably not. Um, it, it's, a, it's probably a good entry to both answer your question that came up earlier and then respond to that. So, you know, I certainly listened at the Thursday night meeting where that seemed to be a, a, um, a way forward that people were really interested in. I can tell you what I came up with pros and cons, some of which, you know, I, I talked about in the meeting and then I actually spent some time this weekend reflecting on it. And I, it's hard, I would struggle to make that recommendation and, that, and I will share with you my thinking around that. So, you know, one of the things I, I absolutely heard is more open space for kids to play. People talked about sixth graders wanting to run around across the valley has lots of open space around there and they felt that that would be um, a better play space for older elementary students. Uh, access to the observatory absolutely came up. Um, but there, there are a couple, there are a number of things that, that concern me when I look at the bigger picture. Um, one is that there are unresolved discussions related to does sixth grade belong at the elementary or does it belong at the middle level? So we're unclear as to where that, that lands ultimately. Um, at Reading Elementary School, we, um, we voted last year to move grades four, five, and six. And if you were in five and six there, you have a situation where you have Reading students that would be at West for one year and then moving on to, to Prosper Valley, and that is, uh, that is a concern for me. Um, when you look at fifth and sixth grade, they lose access to the innovation lab, they lose access to a full-time counselor, to a full-time nurse, to reading interventions and math interventions. Because of the size of West, we are able to provide services that we simply cannot provide in the smaller schools, and those are big losses for students in fifth and sixth grade. Um, that when I get back to thinking about this, time, energy, focus, processing, Census around three communities. You know, my guess is that many in Woodstock would have a different opinion, and some in Reading would have a different opinion. And we need some clarity around this, and this is something that could take focus away from board meetings for, for months. Um, and then financially, if you put in a, a five and six, you need a principal. That's, that's a significant expense. You increase your special education costs, that's an expense. There are smaller classrooms in Prosper Valley than there are at West, so there's potential, potentially a need for more sections and more teachers. That's an expense. Um, and uh, there is additional expenses to reconfigure the primary wing, which is currently set up for, for young students. So when, when I do an analysis of it, I, you know, I, can, I can certainly would agree it has always been a beautiful space for all kids. Um, outside and those big bodies having a lot of space to run around, I certainly see the benefit of that. Um, but when I look at all of these other aspects, it raises concerns for me. Um, so that that's my thinking through sure. that. My, my, my second part of my comment is about the actual fixing of the building. A lot of these things, listen, I've been doing this for almost 20 years in construction, I do it every single day. A lot of these things that we talk about, like fixing the drains, it's not very complicated. Yeah, there will probably be some digging, there will be an excavator, but it's plastic pipe, and it, it's not very hard to fix. I know this for a fact. I, I, 
I've done it. Um, I mean, putting a catch base in it, not very difficult. All of these things, they can happen real fast. I caution you, the longer you wait, winter's coming. I mean, that's the reality. If you want to get it done before it freezes, you better be calling somebody tomorrow and start lighting this up. Because a lot of people are going to tell you you something on that tongue. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are tons of people right here in the community that would do it. Guaranteed. I, mean, I know that. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're not going to stop calling, you're going to have to wait till spring. And you may find that, you know, things happen. It's wet there. You know, most people are going to want to wait until it dries out before they start drying on it. I mean, you're going to have a lot of heavy equipment. So, just because it's springtime doesn't mean you're going to start. So, if you really, really do want to do this, we've got to come to some sort of decision about how much money we're going to spend, where we're going to spend it, and start getting somebody in there. Because I'm telling you, winter's coming. I already feel it. I, I know because I work outside all the time. Winter's what? The winter man. <laughs> that Game of Thrones, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, my point is that you, you better step on this faster than, than later because it, it, it won't happen if you if you if we wait. It will not happen. Uh, I, I, two, uh, two comments. I agree with the prioritization of the timeline of this. Uh, Putting this, making this, making an action about how we're going to remediate this first and foremost before we figure out what we're going to do with it. Um, the second piece is I just question why are we talking about opening a second pre-K when we have a pre-K here that's not utilized? Yeah, and why are we not sending pre-K from that wait list of 10 to 20 from Woodstock to ready? We're, we're talking about adding things, but we're not utilizing the capacity where we already have. So pre-K is, is parent choice, so people can sign up where they want. Um, parents did not choose, they chose to go to other private pre-Ks in the Woodstock Western Valley area. I think probably because of the distance. Um, but are, are we, are we, I'm just thinking about revenue opportunity, are we, when people are coming to Woodstock and saying, I want to go to pre-K here, we don't have space, are we saying, we're a district, we have 11 spots down the road, or are we saying, We'll put you on a wait list. I, I just, going back to like maximization of resources and we're trying to increase revenue and reduce losses, I'm just baffled that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna add a whole other three Ks. Is that gonna produce another classroom like we have here at Reading of eight kids? And that's not an efficient use of a teacher's salary. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we, that's, that's something that's been posted about the opportunities and posted. I know when I've had conversations, I've had a couple couple conversations with families, I have offered um, both Reading and Pillington as, uh, as, uh, as options. Um, we can be more intentional around that. Um, again, I suspect that it has to do with the length of the commute, and, but that's something we can start to be more intentional about. I can speak to that directly since I take the applications. I absolutely marketed Reading hard. Absolutely. It's, there's no public transportation for preschoolers, so parents have to drive them out here, and it's just not, they're not able to do that in working into their jobs. So you say that what leads to believe that folks who want their kids to go to Woodstock for pre-K and get it turned away, you're going to drive them to Humphrey? Well, is it, there's a six-minute difference versus about a half-hour difference. Between? So there's a six-minute difference between Woodstock Elementary and Concord versus um, the, the, the length of time it takes to get out here and ready. ready. Yeah. Claire? Um, hold on. Patty? Um, Sorry. So I have a, a few comments and questions. Um, you know, I think the breaking down of this process of the remediation, you know, we don't know the size of the unit we need in this building until we know what happens when you pull that moisture away. So that $550,000 may be substantially less if all of the groundwork changes the readings of the building. So to do this all in one lump sum um, with the biggest unit possible seems like a, a bad planning process for me. So that's, that's point number one. I have many points here that are completely not related, so you're going to just put up with me. I'm so sorry. Um, 
have we discussed with the pre-K teacher at West, um, or the pre-K advisor at West about this change and how um, she this feels is very, about it? This is very preliminary in terms of talking with um, the configuration. You know, it's, it's certainly something we would discuss with her. So we haven't? She, no, that's not a discussion. Okay. Um, and that Bridgewater, is, am I correct, Bridgewater is opening up a pre-K in their old school? Is that, can anyone from Bridgewater speak to that? I will tell you about this, because I do know about this. <coughs> so the Bridgewater Community School is now being, I mean, currently is being transformed into a community center, which, you know, may be from, you know, elderly to what you're talking about now. Yes, they are looking into having a program there for children. <clears throat> now, I don't know who was going to be in charge. Mm -hmm. I don't From what I understand, they do not have a specific person that is going to be in charge of that. I think that they're still looking at hiring somebody. Um, but yes, and, and they are looking into, like, they want to have it open by January. So Bridgewater and other towns that you know parents may drive through Bridgewater, there is going to be an opportunity for them to have their children there. Okay. And the other benefit is that the school bus stop is right there. So there will probably be, you know, after school activities. I mean it's gonna be something bigger than, you know, just you know, little kids. Okay. It's it's a community center for everybody. But, but I just I was wondering about the impact of that new pre K plus um, you know, the expanding rainbow programs in fact affecting the numbers for next year is something that we consider um, when thinking about whether or not we would have two full classes of 20 um, in the new building. And then it, it, the um, line about it being revenue neutral, I, you know, I know Jody um, Eaton had put a lot of time into trying to get licensure for pre-K at Prosper, at, at Pomfret, when it was Pomfret, and I know John, um, Hansen worked on it. Um, do we know the cost of making that school pre-K ready? Because there are some fundamentally big problems there with that. I mean, there's fencing for the stream. There's there's, there's yeah, the layout of the campus related to the playground space, mm -hmm. and then we, we believe that, that that can be absorbed within the five hundred thousand. Um, and then the the other piece around the pre-K, and, and again, a lot a lot of this. You know, we don't know until we open things up, but I will share again that one of the things that's really unique about this district and has, is the fact that we offer free, full day, um, high quality pre-K. Um, and so that, that, that is something that I, I think has been of interest to families. I think one of the other things that we know about early, early childhood care is that we, we have an issue not only with but we also have an issue with um, younger children in terms of like, finding high quality child care. You know, so is there a way to partner with some of these private places to be able to provide some of the, the younger younger care um, so that we're, because that's certainly a need as well. Um, but we, we are currently poised to be able to provide full, uh, full day free pre-K. We're in a very unique situation that was the most moving forward to put that in. Um, so I, I suspect that we would still get a, a high level of interest. I can't guarantee it because you just don't know until that shows up. Um, and to the point about um, potential partnerships with higher education programs um, that you can't clarify about right now, like when would we be knowing about that? And I, you know, I would assume those programs are going to require some substantial renovation of the building to make it adult. No, I mean, yeah, and what, why would you go? I'm not sure exactly why you put a bunch of adults in an elementary classroom without refurbishing it. Yeah, you what, we would, what we would look to do there, and again, that that's the space would be outfitted for young adult adult learning environments. So the, those are things that actually would be less expensive because you probably wouldn't have to put that cabinetry in that kind of thing. Um, and it would be a space that would be appropriate for intermediate, elementary teachers students all the way up to a, a higher ed. They're, they're just simply classrooms. That is something that is one, one I think, promising potential for this district. 
um, and the oak, but what you'd actually be doing in terms of opening that space wouldn't be any different than what you would set up um, for young adults or adult learning experiences. Um, and I guess the other the point I would argue is that, and I think you heard a lot of this on Thursday night, was you know, how the West Campus is just more geared to the young kids. You know, it, it seems odd to take pre-K and K away from the campus that is, you know, playground-wise, significantly better situated for younger children and not situated for the kids that run around and get concussions on that campus. Um, you know, so I would argue that that point, um, you know, pretty hard. And I would also, I think somebody at the meeting who was on the configuration committee, again, I was not there, so I apologize, they you know, said they hadn't even toured um, the Prosper Valley campus, and I guess I would, you know, say that everybody on that committee should be in that campus, in the building, on the campus, um, as we all should, um, you know, before these decisions decisions are made. That's it for this the moment. Claire, um, I'm trying to gather my thoughts. Um, so I, I want to echo a few things that I heard. One, I think it is, it does feel a little premature to pigeonhole us into a use for the building. I think, I, I really like the idea of these, um, you know, lower cost investigations or remediations in terms of how we move the water away from the building. It sounds like if that's great, that that is something that's within the budget, and that's something we could start quickly to at least answer some more questions and, and get the building that, that another step closer to being a viable building that we can use. I think that's something we really need to, to think about and think about carefully and move forward with that. I also hear a lot of themes about the site being a really amazing asset, and I agree with that. It's a beautiful site, to the forest and the stream and the observatory, and just thinking, what can we do immediately to put that asset to use for our students? Um, well, because I do think we shouldn't have any knee-jerk um, reactions to, let's get the building back and operating. I think it needs to be a really thoughtful process that does take into account the needs of the communities and the district. I think Adam raises a really great point about what's the capacity of Reading. We also should be asking what's the capacity of Killington Elementary and Barnard Elementary and Woodstock and are, are there other ways that we should be thinking about um, where the students go um, and then thinking about the proper balance school within that context I think is really important. Um, so thinking about what what can we do now, like re, or, you know, re-establish the Force Fridays, can we put a yurt up there now so that John Hansen can get the students back there using the observatory? What are some creative things that we can do now that are low cost that fit with an existing budget to actually utilize that space and that asset? And then also to address the Pomper Valley's concerns, uh, Prosper Valley uh, families concerns about the playground, can we start sending the fourth and the sixth graders to Bale Field for recess. You know, I know that other people in the community have expressed concerns about the congestion of pick up and drop off. Can we start staggering pick up times at the end of the day for different grades to kind of address some of those, the community's concerns on a more immediate basis? I mean, some of that's probably too granular to be discussing now, but I just wanted to, to throw it out there just I think we hear what the concerns are and, and I think there are some small steps we could make that would make a, a big difference for for families and the experience that the students are having this immediate academic year. Um, and then I also cycle back to the 55 to 68 million dollar um, larger kind of looking at the campuses as a whole and I do know that about five million dollars was initially kind of softly earmarked for the elementary schools one million dollars of which was for the Prosper Valley campus. So it kind of feels like that's something we should be moving forward with in a whole context rather than Let's go to a bond for 550000 for a school that we don't really know what the best use of that building is yet. I mean, I feel like we should be acting with urgency across the district to address the shortcomings in all of our buildings because right now we have a building with 550 students in it that has some significant shortcomings. And I'm concerned, and what are we learning from this experience with the Prosper Valley School where there wasn't a hundred percent fix over the years, successfully mediated, right, and then it came to a head for whatever reason. But we know that there are a lot of issues within the middle and high school that are going to come to a head as well. So can we push this entire initiative forward with emergency for all of our students across the district? That's all I have to say. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I had offered, and that's why I put my little chart, because there, there are, there's a lot of different factors playing into this. 
um, that we, we have to pay attention to. Um, and part of it is, you know, what the board decides to do with one thing impacts another thing, right? Um, and, and this is not an easy decision for anybody to make, and I, and I think there's a, a real sense of um, wanting to get this building open and viable back in, in Prosper, at, at Prosper Valley, um, but we are sitting with an issue related to the middle school high school and what is the impact on that. Um, and you know, and the other thing that I would add to that is not only do we have a, a significant issue at the middle school high school, which I, I think there's pretty broad consensus that building has outlived its useful life and we need to do something about it, but we also have program programs that we need to get going so that not only is our building state of the art, um, but that our programs are the best in the state as well. And so paying attention to those kinds of areas is also critically important. Um, the board did pass me to come back, but I would recommend for its use, and I, I am doing that. Um, I, I appreciate the, the, the questions about is, is it something that you can start doing a little bit earlier in terms of an engineering piece? I will tell you I am not an engineer, so I rely very, very heavily on um, what far many of you have much deeper knowledge than I do. And if people are feeling like there's some things I can get started, you know, I certainly would not be opposed to that. It's simply not my background. And I, I don't know if this was a number of Yeah, and I think there is a clear consensus that we could take the next logical step, which would be to determine whether the, what is it, about 35,000 gallons of water a month that comes off that roof has any impact on the issues that we've got. And I think that's logical because we don't know, to Patty's point, how to size the HVAC <coughs> until we can remove other variables. And that's the next variable, and it's doable. There could even be some in-kind help with that number. And as I identified with, you know, to, to last Friday, I think Richard and Mary Beth, I was asking in terms of the current budget, what do we have available to us that would help cover the costs of being able to begin that work immediately? So that, that would be a logical, for me it would be a logical next step because it's not just the purchase cost of the HVA system. As people have noted, it's the ongoing carrying cost of perhaps having to have a system that is trying to pull more moisture out of the air than is necessary because you may discover, although I did ask Joe, Today, so we've had some pretty dry weather. I asked him whether those moisture indicators had changed. He indicated not. So this may be a water table issue, and or it could be, it could be. But we need to find out. We need definitive. So yeah, I, there were air quality studies done in that building before the mold was visible last year. Air quality. No. Were there were air quality studies done in the building before the mold was visible? No, not to my knowledge. Yes, there actually were. There were. And we, we have found some of the, the documents continue to surface at different times. So there were, and there's, there's been an ongoing issue as it relates to moisture in there and the flooring. I mean, this, this, it's not. It came to a head last year with an especially miserable, moist summer for everybody. But yes, there's, there, there's been, and we heard here, it started back you know, many, many years ago. No, I'm just asking because that is a legitimate health concern. Yes. I mean, I think the other, the other, concern, other concern that I have is um, wrapping this all up in a bond is highly risky. So we would have to, we would have to convince voters that the reason we're investing 550 million, sorry, is. I mean, we really need to be certain of that number. We'd be going to a number, and then we'd be going to a program proposal that may or may not strike your fancy. I think it's highly risky. You then have potential for a multi-million dollar bond coming soon after that. And based on conversations that are happening in a working group around the financial viability, also in charge of our committee, to look at how we might pay for a new middle high school, there's the possibility that could happen. We were thinking, well, if we were lucky, we'd get to March of, of uh, 2021. And it could be sooner than that. So my concern is, is if, if we set a precedent with losing a bond vote on this, it could impact the next bond vote. And having two bond votes just doesn't make sense to me at all. So I come, I come back to taking the next incremental step. Is there a way to identify tonight? Can we identify an amount of money that we know is in the budget 
um, that we could identify and, and support the next logical step in this process and begin the, the re-landscaping and the foundation work around the school and get that done before ground three. Is that, is that possible? Can I, can I take on? Sure. It's up to you, Paige. Melania's had her hand up for it's <laughs> <laughs> it's the most important thing to hear from Richard. It is. Where is and, and, and do we have any money? Well, the way I look at this is the financial side is an enabler, it's not else. If the board tells Mike to find, you know, a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, we'll go in and say we can find hundred and twenty five, either it's free and clear because it changes or it has an effect as it relates to other initiatives that are in place. So all I'm waiting for to a degree is the direction to find it. Is, it. is it 50, is it 30? We've got some in reserve, we've got some in different, we've got other capital projects that are going on. So what I'm looking really for here is what's the direction, how much are we talking about? And I can certainly work with Mike over the next few days and he can beyond that. We'll free it up and if it has implications for other initiatives, we can speak to what those are. And the board can decide which one is a higher priority. I know that Joe said in Pomfret, and I thought that number was somewhere between 60 and 80. Yeah, and that's, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Bob, that's, that's just not a valid number. Okay. And um, they're, they're dollars in there because Prosper Valley kids are at West that we really need to be supporting some of the functions at West for custodial, for maintenance, and some of the other things because we have more kids there. But there are dollars. I can't say that it's all free and clear, and I'm actually assuming it's not. Okay. But I do think we can come back and say, we'll do without this, or Mary Beth will push off a strategy or something else, and therefore we'll free up the following amount of money. If we, sorry, Beth. Okay. If we don't make a decision tonight, we're two, weeks, two more weeks out. I don't disagree at all, Bob. I, I think we have all the information we need. It's now a decision to go and to do that. And Seth, Seth is still, Seth is still here and raised a good point at the la last meeting of, are these numbers hard or are they soft? These numbers are soft. We haven't been able to go out with someone and say, put together a hard bid, real dollars, because we have the money to do it. And no one's sitting around waiting to do bids. So if we have, we're going to do this work, we'll get some hard numbers and probably some good bids on those, and we can tighten down this 550. We just, we need that next direction. Okay. Um, I think it's, I don't, know, I don't know, it's not the word exactly, but it's, uh, it's inappropriate to think that people are going to vote positively for a $550,000 bond and then vote down the, how many millions are we talking for the middle school, high school projects now? Tens. To think that the reason that they didn't vote for the 50-60 was, oh, because I gave you 550. Those numbers are so dramatically different to think that for 500, you know, yeah, people might say, I can do the 550 to support putting a building back into, into this district, but I can't, you know, I can't pay my taxes on this bond. You know, so I, 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 I would argue that, that that argument of because they okay this one, they're not gonna okay that one, seems a little unrealistic to me. Two school years ago, not this year, two years ago, two school seasons ago, about a week before school opened up, or was supposed to open up, this board met, not everybody was on. We were told that we spent $25,000 prior to that school vote, to that, to that meeting already. We were asked for how much, another $25,000, okay, and the board unanimously approved it, and we went forward. I think, I mean, it's been so long, but, I believe that we voted another $50,000 or $75,000 if Joe was still here, I don't think he is, but, but came in to say that we wanted to do those test pits and everything else, and I believe we approved another $7, thousand dollars, it was at least $50,000. No, I mean, 7500 to put those. Okay, well, well, we did it all within the amount of money that was provided. So, Jim. So, so basically, what we're going through here tonight, and we've been going through for a while, is, is that you know, do we have the money in the budget for how much, for when? And are we talking, you know, uh, 
I have friends that will come in, I'm sorry, but I have friends that will come in and do work. Well then, where are they? Step up, say you're here, so we can get you in there and do it. Or, you know, we don't have people that's gonna do it because they're busy right now doing other stuff to make a living, and they can't do it so quick. <coughs> and we have to go hire somebody on to dig up the building and everything else. How much is it really going to cost? All right? Talking about 375,000 gallons or whatever off the roof or whatever, I mean, come on, you don't know how much, you don't know if it's gonna rain this month or next month or whatever. It's, you know, you're telling me winter's coming, so it's not gonna rain. Um, you know, do we dig up the building around and start putting in pipes and do we start diverting and putting boxes or whatever? And what's the number? And if you're asking me tonight to vote yes or no on the number, I need the number. That's what I need. Because I don't want to sit here again like I've done in two or three other votes, because some of us do believe we voted for 50 grand or more on one. How much I've, has been spent total, Richard? Approximately $50,000. Okay. So I want to know how much. And, and then for those that are sitting here not really arguing with me, but I say put the vote up for the 550,000. It's a vote to say not to exceed 550,000. Obviously, you're not going to start doing testing on humidity in the building until you start diverting the water away. You, you vote for the full bond of what you think. Get me hard numbers. Maybe it's not $550,000. Maybe it's $250,000. Maybe it's $800,000. I don't know. That's not my job as a board member. My board member is to make a vote on a number. Get me a hard number, and then I vote. But it has to be not to exceed, and then it's going to happen in steps. I mean, Seth, yeah, you bring up great points. Why would you test something until you move the water away? But why would you not work your budget out to say this is what it's really going to be if it's at the top end? So let's go for the full number, a hard number, we don't have to wait two weeks. We can have a special meeting. If you can't make it, we can call in and just give me a hard number. If it's, I've been waiting for a hard number now for a year. I'm done. Well, I, um, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I reminded you. So, yeah, hard numbers and whether or not it has to go to a bond, depending on what that hard number is and whether we're talking about 500K or 85K. Um, and then the bid process, Richard, that is, is a process. So how long is the bid process? Because it's, it's an actual, there's a timeline for that. A month. A month, right? It has to go out to bid a for certain a certain amount time, of time being out in the market. Except the bid. Could, we could probably do it shorter than that. And then, so is this something that could be, there's a finance meeting, what, tomorrow? Tomorrow. So is this something that can happen tomorrow? Is this not feasible to have this discussion tomorrow? Do we have a hard number? Do we not have a hard number? You should wait until you get a contractor's price before you find out if you even have any money for it. Because if they come back and say, listen, it's going to cost my company $80,000, But we don't to go through the bid process. Well, there is a bit of a chicken wing there, and, and, but I, what I'm hearing the direction from the board is we want to make this go forward. We want to see what free funds are to take care of the exterior drains, take care of the water, and if we can do the next piece, you know, the demolition inside to clear the floors. We'll try to tighten those up. I think we can, and we can certainly initiate the process of are there free dollars? And, um, and again, have a conversation with Mary Beth of their free dollars if you can hold this off or change this or do other things. So by tomorrow afternoon, by tomorrow afternoon, Mike? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> by tomorrow afternoon, I think we can be better informed. You've provided a lot of direction already today. So I, I, I think we can have a better conversation on that. I'd like to say, actually, listen, I, I, I understand what Jim said. Um, I don't exactly agree. I mean, it's more difficult to go out and put a bond out there and everybody can buy it and understand the nuance difference. So you're going to be between 550000 and $55 million. There are voters that just don't get it. They just see I'm voting more for education. I'm going to say no to that, right? I think taking the next logical step makes sense. Let's see what works, right? Let's see if we can be in this building and we can take some water away from it. That doesn't jive with the mechanical report that we got, with the right. water coming up from the center. I won't point that out, right? However, 
it does make sense to at least take one more step. We've taken plenty of steps. I thought we were closer to 100,000 being spent. We said closer to 50. Yeah. All right, let's take one more step and see what we can do with the building before we make a decision on what's going to happen. We should give it as much process as we can. As my opinion. If we're going to roll it into a funding mechanism, I think we roll all these things together. We improve all of our elementary schools and middle school, high school at the same time. One big chunk. As difficult as that might be. So what's the number and how do we get it? And if we lose any programs in any of the other schools, that's all. Yeah, we should have the trade-offs. That's all. Yeah, we need to understand the trade-offs. Yeah, we need to understand the trade-offs. Can we can clear though? Is, there, is, is Richard? Is Richard? He's accepting a direction for the immediate, which is to go back into the budget or, or go back and assess the costs to do what's been outlined in terms of the exterior of the building. Correct. Okay. So that number. So a motion tonight. To a not exceed is is would be premature. Let let you figure out what that would be. Yeah, I mean I think you've gotten from Joe and from the team this is the best estimate. And now that what we're hearing back is we want to do it out of the current budget. Okay. You know, current budgets are all accounted for somewhere. So if we're going to do it out of current budgets, we've got to free it up or find it as. I haven't gone through that step, or we haven't gone through that step, and we'll go through that step now. And Richard, the question is, how do we do it quick? I mean, waiting two weeks. It's not. I, I heard somebody say winter is coming. Uh, uh, I'm not yeah. sure about that. I wouldn't uh, have by the door open, but the, um, yeah. yeah. So how do we do it quickly? Yes. I have enough knowledge of the budget and in working with Mike. Uh, truthfully, I think by tomorrow afternoon, we can get a pretty good idea of some so of the I different pieces. So I guess my question is for the one director, how do we do it quickly? What has to be off the by the board? Right now. I also wonder, can we get really clear on the scope of work you want done? Well, that's what I was going to get at. So, so, what is it? So, Seth, I'm going to reach out to you. Oh, okay. I'm going to blow past Paige. What are we actually saying from your town? How are we going to get 375,000 gallons of water off your roof? 35,000. Oh, 35,000. Okay. I thought 375 was kind of high. But, on average. Okay, on average. Far enough away from your building, okay? Because we understand that the 18 inches of sand is a wicking device, okay? So that means putting something, gutters or whatever, or, okay, what do you, what are you, what are we saying we're going to do? Joe has things for boxes, collection, and then right. piping it out. Right. What exactly is this board going to tell Richard to come up with the price for? And we're not going past those recommendations. So what are we looking to do? The only place to start doing is to follow the recommendations that are listed in the engineer's report that came out on March 20th. Okay. And one of the recommendations they list is to improve the drainage around the building. Part of that includes removing planting so that you get positive slope away from the building. And then part of that is fixing the foundation drainage, which um, Joe is familiar with. There are some issues with pieces. I think you have to remove the landscape. I think you have to establish positive slope away from the building. I think that you have to fix the drainage system that's around the building and you have to waterproof the foundation. And I just want to, because we've, we've got folks here, and I, and I know some of you have a deep knowledge of this, but I also wanted to check with our finance and operations. And what I would say on, on the drains, we might be able to, to flush the drains and repair the down, the, the clean outs. If we're going to, if we're saying we're also going to waterproof the foundation, that means we've got to dig all the way around the building. So even if we can flush the drains that are there, we're now digging all the way around. So as soon as you said that, do you believe that that's a critical part of this next step is waterproofing the foundation walls? If it was my house, I'd do it. Then we'll incorporate that into the pricing. And then all I'm getting at is, is I was asking for information from someone that lives in the town of Reading, and or Pomford, I'm sorry, and, and the suggestion. So it's up to this board. I'll make a motion now so we can go into conversation that we authorize Richard to find pricing for. Go ahead, Seth. You throw in the no, 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 no. No, I mean I don't need to. Recommendations from the engineering. Okay, Richard. 
recommendations it's from not, here. It's not recommendations from Seth, a citizen of, of Pomfret. Well, I'm going to get into fixing the water pipes around the drainage around the building. If you hire the engineer, if you hire the engineer, it's fine. This is a number of elements in the engineering report. I just want to get clarity on how far you want to go. Foundation drain, waterproofing, water boxes, to move it away, and grading. Those four things. And that's a great next step. And that's my motion. Can I do okay. Someone had a second. I second. Can I just ask a question? Uh, and that is the from what Joe would explain, uh, uh, weatherproofing that foundation is going to add uh, considerably to the price tag. That's my it absolutely is because we will be digging around the whole building as opposed to just flushing out the current eight-inch pipes. Okay. Could we? Could we? We can probably understand then the difference between what that initial cost would be. So if we were to make this not to do that, but to just move the water away from the building. That's fine. Okay. 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 If there were people from Comfort who wanted to do some of it, who are capable, you know, this is what their trade is, this is sure. what they do, and they wanted to do some of the work in kind of pro bono, is that something that... I would caution you against that. Okay, I was just curious if they have... For the same reason issues. that somebody told me, why can't we just build a bridge, because we want to pass the buck on to somebody else. I mean, when you have a bunch of volunteers, it's hard to do No, that. I'm trying to for whom it's there. I just feel like I've heard people you say know. that they know people who are willing to do well, it. Well, yeah. I mean, just feel like we should acknowledge that. Are those, are those real, like, a real offer? Is that something that's Guys, like, hold on a second. We have an engineering report that was done professionally. Um, May I read from it? We, we, we have we have the engineering report. Well, the answer to the question, Jim just asked. But, but Richard answered the question. But what I'm saying is, what we need to do is we need to take Joe's lead in how we're proceeding with what we want to do around the building and to the building. We don't need to have everybody's recommendations of how we're going to proceed. We already have the recommendations from three professionals that were hired to, to do the job. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to vote yes that Richard is going to go and look at the monies um, that are needed in order to do this job so that we can do the first phase of remediating the building based on the recommendations for the building from the engineer from the engineering report Joe's recommendations as well as Richard's recommendations based on their expertise Joe has the expertise he has sought out the expertise with the recommendations and the reports that had come to us we, we know what the focus is based on what you guys are suggesting so we know the direction that we need to head into and the trade-offs yes I just want to clarify that um, Joe is, is all he's waiting for is a recommendation for a direction for him to go. Well, the he's on the floor, but right. so that's what he was saying the other night. He's, he's waiting for the board to make a recommendation of which direction to go to get it started. Yeah. And I think that's what we're getting by virtue of this motion, you know, the first step to that. And, and I think just to just to reiterate, I mean, we will. Um, when we meet as a finance committee tomorrow, we'll have a, a general idea of what these things might cost. Richard and Joe then will look for bids from community members. And you know, I mean, I think, you know, the reality is there may be people who could do this work. You know, we need to make sure this is done in a professional manner. It needs to be bid by people with insurance. Be insured, do this work, you know, all this. So, um, you know, then Richard, and Joe could probably have some, a pretty good idea of, of the numbers. And most importantly, in my mind, is really making sure that that the board understands <clears throat> what we are, um, what we would be giving up. You know, what what choice we're making in doing this work. What what will be funded? Can I call a question? Top down in the comments. On the motion. Yeah, yeah, I came on the bike. Okay. 
The motion on the table is have Richard and Joe look into the engineering report and the costs that would be involved of taking, um, moving forward with the first stage um, of remediation. And with and without the foundation ceiling, is that the one? Yeah, the cost would be with it. All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Can I have a motion to go into um, executive session, please? So moved. Second. 